Welcome back to Brews and Business. I'm your host, Braden Cruz, streaming live here at the Blue Studio. And in today's episodes, uh, we're going to have a great conversation about from uh, from near bankruptcy to building an empire. So before we jump into the episode, let's take a moment to appreciate the brew that keeps us going. The episode is proudly brought to you by GI Love Joe Coffee Company, a woman and veteran owned business right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. GI Love Joe offers multiple coffee blends, each meticulously crafted to suit different taste profiles and roast levels. Whether you prefer the light and vibrant Bugle Boy, the all day companion Old Glory, or the pour over favorite Hill to the Chief, or even the strong and robust Bombs Away, there's a blend for every coffee lover. Support local and enjoy the brew that fuels our podcast. Check out GI Love Joe Coffee Company and remember that every sip is a salute to our soldiers. So in today's episode on Brews and Business, I'm thrilled to introduce Eric McClelland, the president of On Call Services and Rentals, and Josh Carnley. Welcome to Blue Studio and welcome to Brews and Business. How are you guys doing? Good. Thanks for having me, man. So Good. from near bankruptcy to on the path to building an empire, what's that about? Well, you went I've bankrupt? Had a, I've had a crazy ride. We'll just say that. Um, so my story kind of starts out to where I've always been an entrepreneur at heart and but I went through the corporate the corporate route first and graduated with a double degree. Um, and then right after I got done, I went and I, I basically was a safety guy um, and traveled around, came back, got a more of a corporate style job and started a business with a partner at that point in time while while I was in my normal corporate job. And in that particular scenario, um, the partner was a very bad partner and he was taking most of the profits and I was being a little too nice, we'll say. And we got to the point where we slowed down and then he disappeared. Right. And I'd been using all of my capital. So unfortunately he kind of left me with the bag and I went from having a couple hundred thousand in cash in my bank account, right. To pretty much nothing left. And it was a pretty terrible feeling as you can imagine. Uh, but it really didn't deter me. I knew what I wanted to do. I hated the corporate lifestyle. Um, and then I had another opportunity to, uh, to start a business and just jump this time instead of doing it side by side and trying to work a corporate job and, and work a business on the side, I just figured out it wasn't going to work. Right. And I knew I had a bad partner. I had to choose, choose a little more wisely. Um, so I did that and I jumped in full force. I was making a you know, well over a hundred thousand when I made the switch to making fifty, I guess, when I started somewhere in there. It was seventy two thousand. Seventy two. There you go. Yeah. So, He's like Josh is like, I recall the moment. Yeah. I recall sitting on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, I I took a step back, you know, but I had a goal in mind, right? Um, and I I knew what I could do. I knew I knew I was destined to do a lot more than just sit behind a desk and and you know play safety guy every day for somebody else. Right. And I knew that there was a good opportunity for me to, to make some money for myself and not for somebody else. And I'd always had that drive to do that. And I just needed, um, you know, a little bit of a push, you know, and I got that. And luckily I was fortunate enough to find a, a good partner that believed in me. And, um, and we were able to kind of mesh very, very well and, and bounce ideas off of each other to get to where we are today. I mean, we started with, I started with four guys and uh, me and, and three others, and we got probably well over 50 now. Um, you know, three 12,000 square foot facilities, countless real estate stuff in our portfolio. I mean, you know, we're we're trying to make our mark here, you know, on, on Tulsa. So, yeah, it's been fun. I feel like you guys are doing a good job. So you're more than just on call. Oh, yeah. Eric, Eric is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We do uh, just under our holdings company, and I know Josh will elaborate a little bit on it, but um, I think we have six or seven businesses, as I lose count now, um, that I kind of help and manage in all, all aspects that I can, right? I mean, I, I have a, I've created a, quite the, I wouldn't say super large or anything like that, but a good-sized business, and it takes a lot of my time, right? So my time is, is the business is growing, is getting – less and less to where I can spend more and more time with some of these other, um, these other up and coming businesses that we're starting. And, uh, but I say I, I work a lot of hours and I really, really enjoy it. And, uh, I'm able to, to also get enjoyment about helping other people and helping them grow their business and, and teaching them what I know. So, which is not a whole lot, but I'm 
I'm working on it. Now, how'd you learn everything that you know? Trial and error, and then I got a, a man. Pretty don't good... you hate that though? <laughs> okay, <laughs> everybody asks that question. How do I speed this up? You, you just got to fall forward. You just got to try it so over and over. Mike and over. at Andalini said it the best. He's like, be a scientist and not a perfectionist. Yep. Yep. But yeah. one of my questions that I almost ask everybody is like, how do you fast track that? Okay, so for like somebody that's starting or somebody that's three to five years in business, you can only try and error so many times before you either a fail so bad that you, you'll never go back. If that's possible for some people, some people, they just don't ever want to go back. They feel so bad. They're just like, no, or you make it, whatever that looks like to them in their, their situation. How, do, how there is how no do fast you, track. How do you experience that knowledge? The only way you can ever fast track it, I would say would be finding a partner that has already experienced it, that can kind of guide you, if you will, if you're willing to accept that guidance, right. Which is another piece to it, in my opinion. Um, but take that experience that somebody else has learned and have him help guide you in, in making the right decisions or tell you where not to make the wrong decisions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So how do you and know you, in my opinion, that's the only way you can do it. So how do you know you found, to fast track it? I didn't know you found the right person. You don't, it's a, I mean, it's a chance. It's just tough. Right. Yeah. And you would have to, I would say, look at their, look at their own, what they've done, what that individual has done. Right. And have some good knowledge as far as who they are, what they've accomplished before you, bring them on as a partner, right? Know them, I guess, ethically and morally as well, too. It's probably a pretty big um, deal. But, yeah, that would be my advice as far as getting <clears throat> on a fast track, which is, is a hard thing to do no matter what. Um, and it does – it's going to take grinding hours, right, um, and a lot of good decisions and some bad ones along the way, too, right? But you got to be able to withstand the bad ones. Is Josh that guy? For me, he is, yeah. Is he that guy? You guys are like a love story. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so my, I needed a guy that I had a vision. So I needed a guy that help, that could help implement it. So I had my fingers in a lot of different pots. And for the OCSR, on-call services rentals vision, I needed somebody that was going to be able to absorb guidance and then implement what I needed to implement and be humble enough to be like, hey, this might not be my way, but I'm going to do what you asked me to do and then and then go out there and attack it and give me good feedback, honest feedback, knowing that he's attacking it full force. And then me as a, as his partner and uh, kind of helping him, guide him, make sure he doesn't go too far left and too far right, is working together and say, hey, being humble enough to be like, hey, he's on the ground floor. This is what he's experiencing. Let's adjust. Let's make adjustments and let's make them quickly. Let's me as a leader and Eric as a leader. We have employees telling us things. We need to make adjustments. We have to be humble or scrap a whole plan that we spend half of a year or a month or a day devising. So, and then providing a lot of capital. You know, when you have a big plan and a big goal, it takes a lot of capital. And from my experience, starting with five thousand dollars when I was twenty three years old, and and building a multi million dollar company by twenty five, and selling that and having a pretty good exit, and doing it again when I was twenty seven, I understood. I learned a lot of, on along the way, having different partners. Not, I didn't have any partners on the first business, but the second business, I had some very good partners, very intelligent people. And learning the finance side of it and the back end side and instilling those things in Eric and other partners around me of why that's so important is to slow it down, get the numbers, understand the numbers, think things through. And then when we go in there and buy, Eric's cheap. He's the cheapest. I have two partners of the cheapest guys I've ever seen in my life. They rather do it theirself and then just hire somebody that's better than, than them to help to free up their time to go. But that takes capital. So I would sit down with Eric, and Eric would want to buy the cheapest truck. I'm like, no, we're not buying this cheapest truck. We're buying the best truck money could buy. And we'd hire the best employee money could buy that we could afford at the time. you know. And sometimes we couldn't afford them, but we just go ahead and hire them. And then instilling my values and my people and then showing my values – how I'm and actually doing them, you know, actually performing them. Hey, this self sacrifice, and let's go hire a better accountant. Let's don't give ourselves a pay raise because we could. Let's go get an accountant. Let's self sacrifice and get that new truck. And we and, still do that. 
To we still day. don't pay ourselves a, a lot of money, which we could, but I mean, we we just don't. I mean, that's not our. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to build something and to do, and we're not we're we're not really wanting to take on a lot of private equity money, which we went down that path, and we still could. Or a lot of outside investors. We can move. Very, we're very nimble, and we can move very quickly with just using our own personal capital. So I've I've got a question. Yeah. Where, I don't know if you guys have read the book Traction. I have, but it, it's a clear visionary and integrated role that we got going on here. Were you looking for him whenever you were you were looking to be better in your company, or were you just looking for someone to help you and you fell across? My claim to fame is he was looking for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and I, 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 I'm bringing this up. I'm asking this question because I, I see you guys and I see a lot of my partnership, my business aspect, right? And I, I am like you. I, I see a visionary. I see things. Um, but the integrated aspect on my end is where I'm missing, right? Whereas for him, he was missing the visionary. And it cracks me up because you had some real life experience. Uh, and I want to bring this up so everybody sees that you have to fail. You have to fail. You got to try. I thought I was this visionary. And I thought I had this integrator. But you guys both just said something that was very important. You have to be open to taking advice from that other person, whoever that is. 100%. Right? Because in my opinion... I did first wrong thing. You, d you didn't do enough due diligence on your partner. My partner's my brother. I thought I knew all the due diligence I needed. Terrible mistake. It, we've made it work, which is fantastic, but I could have had a better partner. Uh, but at the second time is being open to understanding from each other. Is right? he watching? I was yeah. going to say the same thing. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully he's watching. I mean, I got I, a bro brother that's my partner too. Right. And, and don't get me wrong. Like I said, I, I love him and I <laughs> frankly wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for anybody else. But in my head, I had this vision. Mm -hmm. I saw someone who had the skills, who had the, the uh, contacts, who had the general idea of how I can get this business to actually move. I had mm -hmm. tried three or four other businesses that were all on me to try to get up off the ground that I just didn't, I didn't understand enough, right? So then I had the opportunity where I found the integrator. I found the guy who was gonna make it happen for me so long as I was just able to bring these ideas and visions to life. And I asked that question because we, I did it prematurely. I see what you guys had. You had some experience. He went through his integrator asset by himself, but it, you guys married those two together so beautifully. And I think that's obviously made a huge difference to you guys. You guys are compatible. You guys can, he said it's a love story just a second ago. It literally <laughs> seems that way. I mean, you guys come in here, you guys are just meshing together so beautifully that I can tell when you have something to say to him that he doesn't want to hear, you say it. Same thing goes the other way around. And you oh, guys yeah. both accept that. And it, yeah, sure, you go through the aspect of, oh, he, doesn't, he doesn't know. He's not out here. But then you sit back and you're like, damn it, he's right. I think, right. At, I think at this point, you know, and something I'll say that I think is pretty important too that hadn't been said, you know, at least for, for, for our relationship was, you know, I did a lot of stuff, right? I mean, I, he let me get out there and, and he's like, you got to figure it out. You know what I mean? And then he would just guide, right? And to the point now where I just do my thing, I'll come to him. If I got a question, I'll be like, Hey man, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the relationship at this point in time. Like I go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. Right. But if I ever have any second doubt, that's what makes us so that's what makes us so deadly is because I can also go over to him. I can go to another three or four people, right? That are in my office or five or whoever, and that bounce ideas off of us, right? And I think that at this point where we're at today, that's what makes us so deadly is I have my own set of skills and experience now, right? He's got his own set. We've got other people that have their own sets that are, then we're all around each other all the time. And then if we're ever second guessing our own decisions, we bounce it. We have plenty of people that have different experiences in life that may suit better to answer the question. And we're not, we're humble enough. All of us are to go, Hey man, what do you think about that? Right. My idea was shitty. Scrap it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I do. I've had guys that work for me on bottom level that have come up with better plans than I've come up with. Right. And I'm humble enough. Like, damn dude, love it. We're starting that shit tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? And, and and I think that's what makes that what makes a good leader, you right. know. Right. Is that and trust. And trust. Yeah. Like when you start a business, it's tough. You're gonna be putting a lot of time in and you have to find that balance. And this is one thing I always tell my partners, you better be on the same page with your wife. For sure. That's a big one. Because she might not understand your vision. 
Yeah. And my wife and I are on a on the same page. We sit down. We're on the same vision. We're trying to go to the same destination, and that's and our destination will get adjusted in a positive way because we're gonna continue to reset. We're so young, but being on the same page at home will translate to a lot of success when you go into the office. And if you can find – and things happen at home, right, and things change, right? Life but happens. Life happens. But uh, when you go to work, you need to be clear-headed as much as you can and not bring that. And it's the, the work, the work-life balance is just tough in itself, right? I, I've i mentioned to Brayden, I think that's BS. It's a pendulum. There's no balance. There's not really a balance. You <laughs> no, go home. It's one way. It's one yeah. way or the other. You're, you're one exactly. or the other. You're never right in the middle. Yeah. Exactly. And then you you got to make sure you put – Eric and I are on the same page with that. Like we think about when you're on vacation, you're thinking about your company, right? You can't get it. If you when you're at the movie you theater, you're head. thinking about your yeah. company. Yeah. I will wake up in my sleep. My fiance, she's like, so you, you don't remember talking about you were going to close that deal last night? I was like, no. <laughs> she's like, you rambled on for a while about it. I'll tell you something. Here. I'll tell you an interesting experience that I had as, as far as home life goes. Right, I had one set, and it was like the corporate style, which was very regimented, and my wife had the same. So, I had this vision as far as what my life would be like. We'll say in two or three years, right? Which is nowhere near what what I had told her, right? And I envisioned this. I'm going to have so much free time and all this, that, and the other. And then you tell her that information, and I promise she don't forget that shit. Right? No, she so doesn't. Then you get to, especially if she's pregnant. <laughs> so then you get to three years down, right? And it, it, we have to, I have to figure out how to reset. You know what I'm saying? And, and we've, gone, we've gotten along so far from where I started to what I was telling her what life was going to be like to what it is now is, is obviously completely different, right? But it's taken us some time for her to really understand what, it means to me and what it's going to take to get to my vision, right. To what I want to do and accomplish in life. Right. And as long as you can get there, I think even at the beginning, especially for somebody that's never done it, it, you know, I would say be very careful about telling your significant other what something is going to be like, if you really don't know, because I went down that path. And oh, it's a, I, I've been there. And it's a struggle. Oh, you know? If I could only make a million dollars in gross, I'd make this much. And I would, yeah. I'm just going to be chilling. I'll be okay. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that. I literally told my wife when we started our business, she was pregnant with our baby, with our first baby, probably six, five to six months pregnant. And I told her, I was like, hey, babe, we have this opportunity. We got a little bit of money. This is our life savings, right? But we're going to start this business with our brother. Okay, it's great. Sounds great. I was like, it'll be like two years. You know, we'll be, we'll be kicking ass. We're going to have all this work. Two years in, I'm like, God damn, <laughs> this sucks. Yeah. And, but, but now we're, we're five years in, and now the days that I come home feeling defeated, she's like, it's just another day. We, we just got another five more years to go. You know, and it, it's like you guys said, that that being able to talk to your spouse, God, that's a godsend. We literally just said that in the podcast right before, where so many times we will talk about where we came in life, and it always, when it comes, to, well, how'd you do it? Man, my wife supported me. That's mm -hmm. all it was. And it came down to I talked to her. I told her where my visions was. I told her that, hey, so like for me, one of my big, big financial goals is, is financial freedom by 35. I talked to my wife about that. What does that mean? Financial freedom, $10,000 a month where I don't have to work for. Ideally, that's the number. So that's your financial that's, freedom. That's my, my number. That being said, we looked at our path to get there, right, as a team, which I love that you said this because our goal has changed. As now we have three kids versus just one. But How's goals that third change. One? How's that third oh, one? Gosh, she's hell. we're we're talking about it she's now. She's God. I love my kids, but she's wild. She's <laughs> she's the problem child for sure. Uh, how many kids? How many do you have? I have two. I'm done. Oh, you got two, and I have two. Thinking, thinking about my, three. my wife is thinking about three. Hey, look, so look. Let's practice <laughs> the third one. She's it, she's wild, but man, the two would have been bored without the third one. The the two would have just been bored with each other. I hope my wife's not watching. <laughs> well, depending on the age gap, too. Yeah, so like mine are mine, back to I've back to eight, back. I've got eight, nine, and then now a two-month-old. Yeah. So now I've got to be like, all right, was well, this an only child, or do we need a fourth? That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, that's a – yeah. Mine's five, three, and one. So <laughs> – but uh, go back to that whole talking to, to your spouse about things. Uh, I, I say that because initially when we started our business, we had these crazy dreams, right? Just like you. I'm going to – read a couple books, and I thought I, I knew it all. Um and then we're in business now, we're five years later, 
And we looked at what that goal looked like. And originally our plan was, well, we're going to build this business and that's going to give us this financial freedom. Well, two years in, you look at it and you're like up to your eyeballs in debt, barely getting paid every week. You really don't know if this business is going to do anything but drive you into the ground. But you have this dream, right? And we kept talking about it. We kept talking about it. We realized really quickly that financial freedom can be achieved in two ways. Well, ultimately, you have to, you have to cover that, what, that number. But you can either increase drastically your, your income to sustain the life you want, or you can really think about what's important in your life and take away everything that's not important. So that's what we did. We said, hey, our business is small. We can't afford to just increase our income. So what do we do? We start cutting expenses. What's the shit that doesn't matter to us anymore? So we cut Netflix. We cut Hulu. And does it make a difference? No. But it starts to really program in your mind what's important. For, or for at least for us, it did. To where now, the business is now giving us a steady paycheck. It's nothing crazy, but we're, we're making it finally. We can count on that paycheck at least. Uh, we're debt-free. We're literally, like, comfortable at this point. And now you're just stacking money. It's like, oh, wow. So financial freedom could have been work crazy, whatever, to, to get that, that life where now we realized, okay, take away, and I don't have to work that hard to achieve that life. My $10,000 number is not the $10,000 number I need to live the life I have right now. That's the number I want for the life I want in the future. So financial freedom, I can hit it much sooner, but that all came down to talking with my wife and figuring out what was important to her at home to be able to sustain the kids, whatever that, that took. And at home, at, at work, being able to know that, hey, my wife, she doesn't need the new bags. She doesn't need the new car. She's okay with all that. She's going to take care of home with what she can. So now I go to work clear-headed, knowing that I have to work on this business to give that my wife that life that I promised her five years ago now that she would have in two years. And being able to have those communications and those conversations between the last five years of our business and our lives has really put it in a perspective where now those conversations are almost just like day-to-day -day talk. Well, hey, this is how the business is going. This is what's going to happen now. And our goal is like we actually, Braden just went through this too, but we were looking to buy a house. And we're looking at all our numbers and everything. And we're looking at it. I was like, you know what? I think we're going to wait. I mean, we've been waiting for three years now. As a business owner, there's all these hoops you got to jump through to buy a house, all this BS. I was like, we're going to wait again. And she's like, okay, whatever. And in the back of our head, we're, we're like driving somewhere, I think later on in the day or something, and we're talking about the house again. I was like, you know what? We're just going to wait longer because ultimately we're going to teach our girls delayed gratification. We could have this right now. We could make it happen. But you're sacrificing. You guys talked about those sacrifices. We're sacrificing right now, and later on, those returns will come to us. Just talking to your spouse, talking to that other person. You guys talk, your, your relationship, you can tell in your business, it's like your family you're taking care of, right? You got your mom and dad, and you got your family you got to take care of. And you guys are able to communicate over that and be able to make sure the shifts change because at the end of it, you guys just said, you have one goal. Make sure that company is good enough that it's going to take care of us, our family, and everybody that's included in these companies. And that only happens by sharing those goals and sharing those ideas in that business where – I think a lot of it comes, hey, I need partners, I need partners, I need partners. It's like, yeah, but you got to find the partners you can actually talk to, like actually talk back, feedback and understand that, hey, sometimes we made a decision and it didn't work. But guess what? Like you guys just said, change the plan, scrap the plan, be humble enough to say it. And I think all that, like you said, if you can do it at home with your wife, it's way easier to do it at, in your business because you're actually free to think about your business. You know, I think as men, we understand that to I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to go to work every day thinking about what lesson my wife's going to teach the kids at school or what she's going to cook for lunch or, frankly, what's going to cook for dinner. I just want to go home and say, hey, babe, that smells amazing. <laughs> Thanks for dinner. And then I'll sleep and wake up again next tomorrow at, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever and go back to work. But you guys mentioned that, and, and I just think I bring this up because we talk about it all the time how your significant other plays such a big role in your success, in your business, especially as an entrepreneur, because you do not turn that off when you clock out. There is no clocking out. There's no clocking in. It's from the time you wake up to the time you go down and every dream in between. <laughs> it's literally you're always thinking about business. So you have to be with someone who understands that pain, frankly, of never being able to say, well, I'm on vacation. Leaving the phone in the hotel room on vacation is like anxiety attack just waiting to happen. Everybody knows I'm on vacation. This shouldn't be bothering me. But something inside you. My phone stays attached to, the, it, to my pocket. That's what I something, something inside you just can't let it go. Nope. But like I said, with, with that, I say your spouse, your significant other, whoever, 
they play a huge role in this, huge. And I love that that's one of the first things that you're, you're concerned about with anybody that you go through. What does your home life look like? And like you said, things change. We understand that. But ideally, if you start off with that type of relationship at home, that foundation home, you at least know that person's open to being and letting someone else guide them in certain times. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yeah, like for us, all of our partnerships, that's what's cool about our group on Eric's side, on the holding side, is none of us grew up wealthy. So we all have a chip on our shoulder. <laughs> so when I look for a partner or I look for a new partner or I look for a business acquisition, part of the due diligence process is I sit down with the individual and I just get to know them. Most of the time I have either done many business transactions with that individual and watched them over, been watching them over a period of time and or I met that th person through a friend or Eric, met Eric through one of my best friends through uh, college and get to know the person the individual and understand their character and understand what they're wanting in life and seeing if I can push them. Because if I can't push them as hard as I can push myself, the relationship is not going to be, it's not going to work. So once I understand that and then I understand, hey, I can push this person, they're willing to listen, they're not a know-it-all. I have a lot of unique skill sets that developed over the short period of time I've been on those faces of this earth and I have a lot of resources I can tap into. And then I find people like Eric and Jeff and many of other partners I have, and we just inject money into them, inject a lot of resources and a lot, a lot of love. And and I, I'm not a micromanager. I'm not going to sit there and do your job. I don't ask people to do my job. I will make sure that you have enough capital, and I'll make sure you're not going too far left and right, but you're going to have to do your own job. And if you don't you do your own job, I'm you're not going to be around me very long. So... I have yet to lose a partner. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing my due diligence, and I would say that most of our partners are they they love what they do, you know, and they're in all different types of industry from portable restrooms and dumpsters and fencing, and he has a uh, you do a lot of refinery services and manpower now, and to Josh Brandt is a president of uh, On Call Fuel and Lube, and um, on call septic and plumbing, septic the Jeff and plumbing, runs. yeah, power washing in Tulsa, the Devon runs. John Ryan owns, um, I would say that would we'd be kind of competitors. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oklahoma facility services, and he's done a very good job. He started Oklahoma City location this year, so um, just finding the right partner and then putting the love and time in them and understanding they're going to make mistakes and then having the capital to overcome that and then giving them slowing them down a little bit and understanding teaching them what's important. And that's understanding where your flow of your flow of revenue is coming in. And I have a little different philosophy than you do. Um, I like putting my back against the wall cause it's going to make me focus 10 10 X harder. So a little bit different from Eric too. Eric will wait on that truck until he has enough cash. And I'm saying, well, let's go get some sales and support the truck and top line sales is everything. Um, your experience and the way you operate is going to generate your net profit and your margins in there. And that goes from how do you buy your product? How do you operate your people? How do you market? Where do you market? What services and what the quality of services you're going to provide when we go buy dumpsters, we go buy portable restrooms, we go buy fuel trucks, we buy the best. We don't say what's the cheapest. That's not even coming out of my mouth. What's mm -hmm. the best? I want the best fuel truck. And we resource and we find people that can give us the best fuel trucks and the best fuel tanks and the best logos and the best everything. So, you know, um, just having fun with it and spending a lot of time. Eric spends a lot of time at the office. I spend a lot of time in the office. Um, I don't ever look at my watch because sometimes most time when I look at my watch, I'm like, I need four more hours. And it's six or seven, mm -hmm. you know, it's oh, not yeah. like I'm still here. I need four more hours. Mm -hmm. Like today it's one <laughs> and I'm looking at my watch and thinking I got so many more things to do on my list. I'm closing on three rental houses I bought today, you know, two, one I'm going to go close on after this and one I just bought on a spur of the moment the other day. So, and we're watering some Japanese millet. Up in and Collinsville. Eric and I own, I own a couple <laughs> ranches and Eric and I bought our, our first ranch. So how I kind of program my mind is I have personal goals and mine are always being grew, grew up, 
in a small town, you always have these things that you think rich people are, right? People that have land, if you like to hunt, you know, I love to hunt. Eric loves to hunt. I didn't own any land. Yeah, no sure. So I want land. And I I built it up. I bought land. I bought our first ranch. And I we Jimbo and I and we built a beautiful hunting lodge on it. And Eric likes to hunt. And this year we bought our first uh Ranch. Ranch together. So that's yeah. second ranch we own. And we're building a whole duck hunting property in north of Collinsville with that. And it's yeah, called B5 awesome. Ranch. So just finding something that you want to achieve. Eric and I want a jet. And that's we're our gonna, next goal. That's our next goal. We want a jet. And we could probably buy one right now, but we want to buy it. When we do buy it, we want to be able to use it. Right. Where are you guys going to fly first? I like. We like to go fishing together. So we're, we're big in deep sea fishing. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. So, that's probably it'll probably be somewhere around that. He likes to go up to the mountains. So do you guys too. already have the boat, or no? We just pay the guide. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> take it to the fish. we like to fish in too many different places all around the world. We go somewhere every year. Oh, that's um, exciting. We take our guys every year somewhere, um, yeah. and we go f- hunting a lot every year. So um, duck hunting is our kind of our passion, but fishing is what kind of Eric and I like to do personally, just to get away. And we bring customers, or we will bring uh, our partners, etc. So. We spend a lot of time together. We try to get a, a together or get away together at least once a year. So would you say that's that's a big planning time for you guys? Or no, is we that, don't talk about business. That's perfect. I mean, we're always talking about business, but right. our goal is just to be friends. Right. That's how we started, right? Is let's go down here. Let's make we made some money. Let's go down here. This is this lifestyle and this hard work has afforded us to do this. And and when we go down there, we spend a lot of money, yeah. probably way more than we should. But you know what? But it feels good. It's one of those. It's not really. It feels good or it feels bad. It just feels right. Right. It feels like, hey, look, we're we at work this, this hard. We're well, gonna enjoy it. When we do do once a year, we're gonna go balls out. It's funny, will. yeah, because that's what I always say. We do. My brother and I do the same thing. And whenever I we go out, I always tell him, "Let's go act like real business owners." And like, what do you mean? I was like, "We're just gonna spend money. We're just gonna bullshit all day. Like, we're just we're just gonna act like we like we have this big old company." And it just feels good because, like you said, it feels right. You're like all this hard work, one time a year like i'm gonna try to disconnect from this whole deal mm-hmm. a- and and you do try but like you said it just feels right just it's one of those things like you said it uh, rich people do this or whatever it's like, oh not really you're just enjoying a day or well, whatever the, the more you make money what i figured out and you start getting around very wealthy people the less they have and you're like man it's because they're not that's not their focus their focus is when you're when you grew up in a small town and you see somebody driving a nice car or having those things that you think rich people or rich families have or successful people have, the real successful people are focused on the game. Mm -hmm. They're playing the game. So the game is buying a $450,000 fuel truck and figuring out how to make that thing generate a million dollars and go get a hundred of them on the road. Mm -hmm. That's the game, right? Those you're putting a 26 hour to $33 an hour employee in a Ferrari, right? Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the game. So the game is the the things that you can go buy now as a as when you have the cash flow and you have the revenue. The game is not to take the money out of the company. Although those things that you can do and we do do. And when you do buy those things, they don't give you the gratification as is if you did go buy that fuel truck or you did go buy that new hook and lift truck or you did go invest in that company and you driving down the road and you see your dumpster and you see your fencing and you see your green truck on a Walmart parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Or we go, I had to go run down the road late at night one time, and I saw an OFS truck street sweeping a big stru- uh, shopping mall. And he, I pulled up. He didn't know who I was. And I was like, hey, you know. I was like, how long have you been out here? And he said an hour and a half or so. And I was like, oh, or 15 minutes. And I was like, hey, and my, my son was with me. He was like, isn't that your company? I'm like, yeah. He's like, he didn't know who you were. I was like, no, they don't know who. That's right, not the right. point of this whole conversation. Right. The conversation is when you invest into a lot of different aspects of companies and from OFS and different is you have all these puzzle pieces moving. You're right. playing chess game. Right. With that comes nice things sometimes. Right. If right. you're if you're playing the right game and you're winning, right? Yeah. Shit can go bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Real quick. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. Eric just had a truck roll over on Friday. We were about to say goodbye, and next thing you know, he's sending out a skid steer, and I had to call one of my buddies that owns um, Allied. Allied Towing, George Bashaw, and called in a favor, and he took care of us. And Did, didn't we just hear somebody else just run, roll the dump truck? Yeah. 
It that happens. Was, that was a story from Barnhart. That's what it was. Yeah. First one. So <laughs> very, very fortunate the driver didn't get hurt Good. at all. Good. Didn't get injured at all. Um, but yeah, so that was a interesting experience, right? As a business owner, that's something I've always dreaded, right? Because we're using big trucks mm-hmm. in everything that mm-hmm. we do, whether it be a, a sanitation truck, a septic truck, or a big roll-off truck, or a fence truck. They're all big, you know what I mean? And if a person isn't paying attention and your safety isn't on par at all times or you don't have the right cameras so you know what's going on and alerting you and, and making adjustments on the fly, you make one wrong move at any of the trucks that I have, either that individual is dead or the person in front of them or both of them, right, or a whole slew of them. So that's the part that it, it kind of is interesting in the business too whenever you're in the game that I'm in, right, is – we have so many things going on at all times and all of them are, are very dangerous. Right. So we spend a lot of time and effort into our training and finding the right individuals, which I probably said before, you know, finding the right individuals is key to success in business. Um, but the truck situation is, is very interesting. Right. And I had my first roll off or my first rollover. Um, very fortunate that nothing major happened. Um, and I was able to find a replacement and I'm flying somebody to Indiana tomorrow to grab it. And, it was been exactly, I think, seven days. So, but you have to, having the right amount of capital and being smart business guy, where you can price out your goods and services, where you're making money, you're being fair with the customer because you're super efficient, which are, so allows you to be competitive and still make a profit. Eric's been able to. That truck was three hundred thousand dollar truck. Interest still hasn't paid out. He's been able, fortunate enough to go get another truck, get it back on the road, so his service isn't delayed. Mm-hmm. His mm-hmm. Customers don't even know. Mm-hmm. They don't yeah, need to know. And the important thing, is, a lesson that I learned is, is, and I've always kind of lived by this because he's kind of talked about it a lot when we were first started, was having an extra, right? And I know it's hard to really realize or think about, but understanding what you're going to need to service your customers is very important, right? Understanding what would happen if one of those assets disappeared overnight. Can you manipulate? Can you change your systems quickly to be able to service so you're not losing the customers that you've gained and you spent so much money in gaining? Mm-hmm. So right? is, that's that's maybe a good example of where you're talking about being agile and being swift to move. Is that like a decent example of that? I'm saying like, uh, maybe well, a smaller example, but uh, being prepared yeah. is what I'm saying. Is when I go into a business line, like if I was going to go invest in. I say fuel, and I keep on bringing up fuel because that's our hot topic right now. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of capital. We're going out on the limb on this one, and we could we probably needed one fuel truck. We bought two, right? Well, a fuel truck's four hundred thousand dollars. I have a four hundred thousand dollar truck sitting there. Yeah. That's just the truck, not the insurance, not the fuel, and nothing else. That's no. correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So, and interest and, rates aren't getting any cheaper. <laughs> last time no. I looked. So you, you have to, but you have to price out that one truck to pay for two. Mm-hmm. So if customers can't appreciate that, then we would just pass up. You have to be smart enough to pass up on deals too. That's that's been the hardest thing I've ever been been able. It's been I have to like self reflect all the time because now you have cash flow, now you have a little bit of money, right? And now you have a little bit of confidence because you've been a little successful. Well, that shit can go away pretty quick if you choose the wrong deal in the wrong at the wrong time, right? Because you didn't do your due diligence, you didn't spend time thinking about it. You didn't do your research. Is that what happened with the cannabis? No, the cannabis was successful. It wasn't my business line I like to be in. I was never, I don't like being held hostage. I never get into a business line that I can't go do. I'm not a farmer, right? I'm not going to go out there and put the passion into growing medical marijuana like the gentleman I did hire. So the bit... We never lost money in the business. The business is still to this day making a great amount of money. I mean, we were in some, we won a lot of cups in that industry. We had the probably one of the top facilities in the state. It was unreal. Uh, did you go in it? Mm, no, okay. Evan did. You went into it, and we grew a lot of pot, as my dad would say, <laughs> and um, it was successful. We sold to a, a big firm out of Colorado, and they're they're still pulling out hundreds of pounds of it a, um, a month and selling it for a high dollar figure. But it just wasn't really my business line. I didn't, I'm not a farmer. I never really liked it. I grew up on a little small mini farm. I don't, it's not been my passion. That's where you told me to stay in your lane. Remember that conversation? Yeah, I do. Stay in your lane. Like don't get into, until you get your own business honing in. It's amazing then, what came out of the few pieces of chicken last year. <laughs> oh yeah, you did bring me a Cane's <laughs> chicken. 
stay in your lane. I've been taught to stay in your lane, stay highly focused until you you're throwing off so much income that you can afford to take risk. And then that's when you have to look yourself in the mirror. I either want to take that home and go live the lifestyle I think I deserve, or I want to play the game and reset, and I want to go diversify my risk and invest it into real estate like Eric and I have, or go invest it into other companies that we just see that we could either start up from the ground up because we already have the customer base and or we could acquire, make an acquisition, or invest into because it already has a good operator. They're just lacking a few things, maybe capital, maybe um, offsetting their skill sets. Maybe they just need some guidance. Maybe they need some sales. That's kind of our been our niche lately is to figure out we're, we're in an acquisition mode right now. We're getting ready to make – Eric and I are getting ready to make our first – is this our first major acquisition together? It is, yeah. And I've been after this company since I was 23 years old. They were the the cat's meow, and and now they're – they're they're about to be owned by me and Eric and our team. So, and um, after diving into their financials, and I'm not going to disclose who it is, we're like 4X, 5X bigger than they are. So it's just a testament to our hard work, our dedication, and the people we have around us. We've been able to take a company that's been around for 45 years around Tulsa and not only surpass them, but surpass them by 4X in less than three years. And not only surpass them by 4x after diving into their uh, their their financials, but surpass them by making 4x the margins because they're running an antiquated system. So buying that company, Eric's going to be able to... So if I were to ask you how you did it, that would be your answer. They actually contacted us. Hmm. So they actually contacted Eric. We have a good name in the field. We're very fair with our competitors. Hmm. We rely on them, and they rely on us. Eric, is, Eric I've learned a lot off Eric learning that i've always been the guy if you're my competitor i'm gonna kill you that's I've just heard my you mindset say that too, yeah so if you're in my way you're going down eric has a little bit of a different approach to it and it's been neat to see eric has a good relationship with his competitors he can call them he has uh harley holland he had a good relationship with him before they sold out and then the company before that they felt comfortable enough to 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 contact eric so my approach has been a little bit different is I've always been a little bit distant from my competitor, distant to the point where I'm not speaking with them, but I know who they are. I know what they're doing. I know what contracts they have and I want. I know what their prices are. I know everything about them. I'm just not friends with them. Eric's approach is a little bit different, and it's worked for him. So you can have a lot of different approaches, but I figured it out. My approach is not the only approach that works. My approach has worked for me, right? So I'm not going to change my approach. And I go into a meeting now, I'm a little bit more, I've always been nice to people, but I'm a little bit more relaxed. You know what I mean? But I'm still going to go after their business at the end of the day. So I have a highly, when we go into a business now, when I, I remember first starting my business, you know, your million dollars in gross revenue is the first benchmark for any small company. It's like, if I could hit that first million dollars, I have made it. And then it's two. And then it's three. And just then, getting started at one. <laughs> well, now you have to recalibrate and you have to say, I'm not. And then when it's you start getting business, to, huh? It's a different business. That it, once you, once you get past that million, it's a completely different business. I would say once it's you get past point. that five million. Okay. Cause one to two, it's I tough. I could manage it at three pretty much by myself. Pretty yes. much. $3 million. You can do it by yourself. $4 million. You better have systems. $5 million. You figure out every system you just put in place sucks. Yeah. And, and now I'm learning even more stuff now to where I've outgrown kind of some of what I've set up at five, right? Now I've outgrown that. Now I'm like, oh gosh, I gotta have more middle line. I gotta have more middle line managers, and I gotta have, you know, some of these people that were good, that were great, and they still are great for us. We've grown over. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, which is nothing wrong with that, right? They're still they're always gonna have a place with us as long as they follow our follow our KPIs and do what I need them to do, right? Show up to work, all the basics, right? Um, but it's interesting that, and we were talking about this, we have been here lately is just trying to reorganize with the growth, right? Cause there's like levels of it to where, you know, it may work at your system may work at three, but it's not gonna work at five. It may work at five, but it may not work at eight. Right. And, and, and understanding how the changes and what those do. And you learn just a little bit every time, right. Of, man, I was just a little slow on this. Right. Or I could have done this just a little bit better. 
And, uh, but it's fun. Right. And, you know, I think that with, with him and I working so closely together is we, we find a lot of those issues, right. Or he'll tell me, cause I'm kind of the cheapo, right. I'll be like, well, I don't want to get that other guy. He's like, dude, you're going to need it. And he's like, but third time he says it, I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll need him, you know, or whatever. Right. But it's just been interesting as you grow for me, as I've grown, it's business wise, the levels, right. Of which we have to kind of reorganize and, and add more talent here or there, or, you know, change your whole system, you know, or just what have you on the changes as they, as you grow is just crazy to me. Um, and pay your people. Yeah. And you have to pay your people and it's growing by the, by the year. I think yeah, Eric and I, we were laughing. I think I was the seventh high paid, highest paid person in my company at one time. Yeah. I was not the highest paid person for a long time. Yeah. I remember I'm still there. I, I make a, <laughs> there's a saying that I, I, I actually tell Devin and a couple of my other team members. I'm like, we're like flying an airplane and repairing it in the air. Like we'll nosedive a few times and then we're going to repair it and pick it right back up. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Oh, wing fell off. Oh shit. Okay. We'll put that wing back on. Do you agree with that? I did at first. And then what? So now it's, I want to be an airplane. I just want to continue to stay up in the air and continue to take off and stay. When you don't have your systems in place, you're going to have this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The systems help level it out. You don't take as many or as many or as deep nosedives well, like, or the repairs aren't as bad. But well, they are C and OFS. They're seasonal, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to have a natural dip. That's part of the that's part of the business climate we're in. Eric's is seasonal in different vertical lines that he has in his business, product lines that he has in business from portable restrooms, from events. You know, you don't do a lot of events in the middle of winter, right? Or in the middle of summer, or it's too hot, or in the middle cold. of summer, or yeah. construction is starting up spring and fall. They're mm -hmm. not starting up new projects, so their dumpster count might reduce. Every business line has their dips. Let's get that straight. It's the systems of your revenue dips is going to surpass year over year. And that's part of having your good numbers, right? That's part of having accurate numbers and having accurate data that you can reflect on. If last year in May, I have accurate numbers I can reflect on. I did 20K or 100K or whatever the numbers are relevant. And this year, I'm and I'm trying to grow 40%, well, I better be over 20K. It's redneck math. It's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, I'm not growing over year over year. And then Eric has big cash pops because he has a lot of big uh, he has a lot of big customers that have very uh, they have seasonal type work that happen once every one or two years in refineries. They're called turnarounds. So then you might have a big you might look over year over year and be like, man, I'm just not going to make make the mark. But then you can reflect onto your financials because you have enough time and you have enough people in your office to help. Well, I had a big turnaround. It was a humongous cash pop. I don't have a turnaround until next year. And they're not doing it in May. They're doing it in October. So it gives you – and then, okay, let's pull out those turnaround numbers and let's figure out where I'm at. Am I still growing? Oh, I'm still growing. Okay, I'm not that bad. I'm yeah, not, we'll I don't pull those that numbers bad. out. Yeah, we'll, we'll pull, pull those numbers out because they're not real reflection of. Those are outliers of the whole. Yeah, yeah. they're outliers. They're good. You want them? Right, 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 and right. right. Pass up on them, but you can't count on those. Yeah, you can't count on. But on the flip side, he has a very unique skill set, and he has to be able to staff up his entire company to handle these turnarounds that only last ninety days. Oh wow! Yeah, we'll go. We'll go twenty four seven for sixty to ninety days in a row. Twenty four seven always something going on they'll always it always two to three people inside it running and now there's going to be it went from two per shift so that'd be four total to potentially six and now it's at like is this ocsr yeah so wow. now it's like I have, it'll be eight plus the call it five so 13 24 7 Plus, he wow. does need, he did a good job over there. So then he has a janitorial contract. So now we cleaned some of the largest office complexes. And so he's just adding all these vertical lines because people are like, hey, man, good there's not enough young people get into service industry that can, one, it's expensive. It's doing what you say you're going to do is what yes. it is. And being able to, if, if Braden comes to me and says, hey, will you do this or can you do this for me? I'm going to be 100% honest. And if, it, if the answer is no, you're going to know it. And if I'd say, yes, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it at a very high, at a very high way. Right. I'm going to do it to better than anybody else's standard. We're that's how, a very that's high how capacity. Yeah. We're going to provide a, the best service. We're going to show up in the best trucks, with the best yeah. uniforms, the best for mowing, the best fucking mowers you can buy. If you're servicing dump trucks, all of our competitors run, um, cable cables. cables. Yeah. When we sat down, 
we contact a lot of companies around the nation. We're the only Tulsa company at our scale that does hook and lift. Why do we do a hook and lift? Because we're it's more we, maneuverable. It's a, more efficient, more safer, safer, big safer. time safer. It's, yeah, we can instead of doing ten churns a day, we can do fourteen churns a day. It equivalents to equivalents to dollars, so, yeah, right? Absolutely. So getting into doing the research when you go into building build, build, building a business from ground up, you can sit down and slow down and do the research and get into the right things and be like. These guys wish they could do hook and lift. They just can't because they don't, they're already established. They mm-hmm. can't retrofit all their fleet and all their trucks. So now I have a competitive advantage. You ready for my question? We've been talking about this last month. Just get started or cover your ass. Oh, I knew this. Yeah. <laughs> as far as what? Should I just get started in business? Go buy that lawnmower with 50 bucks off Facebook Marketplace and go start mowing lawns for $35 because I'm going to get into business. Or... Do I cover my ass, make sure I've got enough money to get the best lawnmower, get the best branding, the best truck, right? And make sure I've got good insurance. I've got pretty invoices or contracts. I think it but, is, but I was right? going to say, I was going to say, let me, let me give you the caveat to this question. The caveat to this question is in this, in this scenario, this person knows nothing about business. So this is where Braden and I differ. I'm the guy that's like, do go borrow a mower, go find somebody to mow their house and prove proof of concept before you do anything else. I would agree with your way. So I didn't do that. Braden says, make sure all your shit's covered. And if you break somebody's window, you make sure you got your insurance to, to cover that that window. I'm like, dude, you break a window, tell them your mother house for four times for free or whatever. Figure that out on the back end. Just get started. Proof, proof of concept before you start spending. So I went all in. That's how I do every business. I'm all in every time. That's the only way I know how to do it. When I very first started when I was 23, I... My wife and I, Ashley, we had um, a Reese, our daughter, and I was broke, and I worked a job. And I worked that job until I was 25, until like six months after I sold it, I com- my first company. I didn't even know how to write a business plan, and I took a lot of business classes. <laughs> I graduated from Northeastern. Um, Shout out. <laughs> so <laughs> Me too. I, I, I had to go to a, a gentleman. I went to, I went to the bank, and I said, hey, I need some money. And my, I, I, didn't, I wanted to do it on my own. And I went to them and they said, hey, I need a business plan. Uh, Okay. This is my business plan. (laughs) So he was like, I know a guy at Northeastern, small SBA, has a program out there that can help you teach how to to write a uh, business plan. So I went out there to Northeastern State. I know where it is. Graduated from there in Broken Arrow. And they had a free service. And I sat down with them and I told them what I wanted to do. And I wrote a business plan with them. A gentleman named by John Blue helped me write this business plan. And Part of their business, the SBA program, is they help you get into and then link you up with the bankers. So I went to First National Bank of Broken Arrow by a lady named Carmen Medina. And I went in there and I told her my plan. And she basically said, you're broke. And I said, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) And she says, hey, I'm going to borrow. I'm going to lend money on. I mean, you're going to have to hawk everything you have. And I had a nice little home on, on in Broken Arrow, and I had a decent job. And my wife was in school, and I was like, okay, hawk it. I owe money on it anyway. Hawk it. And I had uh, – it was uh, – Obama was in office, and they had a t- childhood tax credit. And it was $5,000, <laughs> and that was my equity stake. Oh, man. And I injected $5,000 in there, and within – we just grew it, grew it, grew it. Bought a truck from uh, Denver. Broke down on the way when I got it. On the way here, I sucked out porta potties for three years by myself, and sucked out holding tanks and had shit all over my face. Had blue all over my face. That's what I made Eric do. He sucked out porta potties. Master. Uh, for the first whole entire year and master sucker. You, well, what it does is you learn how to <laughs> you learn how to do a lot without very much. Yeah, right. So when you don't have very much, you got to learn how to do a lot, and then you have to learn how to be competitive. But at the end of the day, it's the service industry. They need their damn service. So I had I bought porta potties from Jay, Oklahoma, and they were the used most nasty porta potties you've ever seen in your life. I wouldn't even use them. But I was so determined to lease them out. I leased every one of those things out, and I sold that thing. And we, in in less than three years, we had ten trucks and over a thousand restrooms. Wow! So, blew it up, and we did it. I did it on my own, and and that's a. I say I did it on my own. 
I did all the financing on my own, and I, I did it on my own, but I had great people at work for me. Jeff was my first new hire. Jeff's still my partner to this day. Um, and then ever since then, when you learn how to do a lot with little, you still have that farm boy mentality. You still have that cheap mistake cheap mentality, right? You still got to watch your dollars. That's what's going to make you powerful, mm -hmm. right? If you didn't grow up rich, everything that you go above and beyond where you started is exciting, mm -hmm. right? And you, when you started your lawn care company, you probably didn't have brand new trucks. Or, $400 salvage truck. You know, now when John Ryan and I money, started though. a lawn care company, <laughs> we bought brand new trucks. When he started his deal, we bought brand new trucks. It's a different mindset right. now that you have the capital. second one. different levels. Huh? The, the second one, the first one was a slide in tank. It was a slide in tank, but it was an it was a newer truck in it. And a, like a 2005 flatbed Ford F150, was it? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, a flatbed F150? Yeah, and then you put a slide in tank on it. It's like uh I was like I think it's 500 gallons, it's 600 gallons. Oh, that's a yeah, tank. yeah. No, yeah, it was yeah. uh we bought the And they're like a Honda motor a, on it and you yeah. got a you got to start the motor. The battery always right? goes dead. The battery dead. So you got to start the motor on it. Those, those trucks build character, though. I, I miss our first truck. And, and one of the reasons I miss it most is it was standard. And now you can't my find first, anybody. My first truck was standard. Yeah, my you can't find anybody to drive. It broke down because the guy I hired to pick it up burned off the transmission on the way in there. <laughs> well, we, I'll, I'll say we taught two people how to drive standard in that truck. And we're like, hey, it's cool. You know, the clutch is on lifetime warranty. We'll just fix it. We're, we got so good at it. But nonetheless, I, they build character because then when you get the nice truck, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. That's a nice yeah, truck. And it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Exactly. You're like, and then you well, got to make sure your people take care of them. Yeah. yeah. Then they then, then comes the whole mindset, right, <laughs> where now, like for us, we're like single cab trucks. And everybody's like, oh, I hate these single cab trucks. Like, yeah, but you guys, the other ones are filthy. Single cab trucks, you guys keep them clean. So sorry. Mm -hmm. We're working. Well, you need a truck to get to work. You're not in the truck. Your work is not in the truck. You'll be all right. And then everybody gets over it. So, Eric, do you just get started or do you try to cover your ass? I mean, it's a tough question. I'm more, I'm along with, like, with him. I'm in line with him is you can't think yourself into it too much, right? And I think that's where I think if, you, if you're into the – you just can't think yourself too much. Like you can't put too much time thinking through. You, there's a little bit of you just have to jump. You know what I mean? And I think if you can't get across that just jump, then you're never going to get there. You know what I mean? You'll think yourself to death. I hear too many people all the time. I'm saying, well, why aren't you doing it? You have a great idea. You see all these smart people, super smart people. They're working for big corporations. They can do Excel spreadsheets. They can do things that yeah. you're way smarter you than me. still can't do. <laughs> I will never be able to do. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And they're just not where they need to be. It's because they're waiting for the right idea. They're ready for the perfect timing. They're waiting to get enough capital. They're waiting for all these things, right? They could probably write a business plan that makes any business plan that I would ever think about writing wouldn't even be relevant. Right. But those are – business plans are bullshit. Right. There are a lot of what ifs. Plans change. Plans change yeah, the day the that bank, you get yeah. in the that day, truck. The day. It's for the bank. Yeah. The, the bank banks, believes in you. Banks don't even you require it. business plans. No. Really? I've never uh, – I haven't submitted a business plan from since the first one. I don't. The banks, all they look at is personal financial statement. It's a clear overview of how you manage your money, how you manage your money and what the hell do you have coming in? Yep. So at the end of the day, your your personal financial statement is a testament of what you've done. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a testament. If you're if you're a W2 employee, how much money you saved. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you invested that Were you involved in it mm -hmm. or did you just do what my wife does and it just goes disappears every month and. <laughs> she doesn't even look at the statement. You know right, what I mean? Right. So the business plans and jumping into that world is is you have to jump in all in. And you have to be cognizant of what world you're jumping in and knowing that anytime I've ever been into any new business, it's never what I thought it was going to be. It's always – you know how you put an Excel spreadsheet together and you have all these projections of how much money you're going to make and not a fucking one of them works <laughs> – and you realize that that was the stupidest damn thing I've ever I done. I wasted all day on that shit. You know what I mean? And then you get in there and you run it for a year and you're like, man, I made X, Y, Z dollars. Where did it all go? And then you look in your parking lot. Okay, there's a testament. Yep. I have four new trucks. Yep. I have four more employees. I'm going somewhere. It might not be in my bank account right now. It's delayed gratification, as you were saying earlier. And then you get it scaled up. And if you want to take a little bit of it, you can. But I... Eric and I hear it all the time. People are starting to come to us and say, hey, what do you invest in this? What do you look at this? And I'm helping friends out and stuff. And 
the problem with them is they're always looking for the perfect scenario to jump into something. Mm-hmm. Well, they're never going to find the perfect scenario, so they're never going to jump. Either you got it or you don't. And that's why I don't mi- micromanage my partners. Either I'm going to figure out if they got it at a smaller level. And if they got it, they're going to have all the capital they want because the revenue is going to show it. And we know how to speak with banks. We know how to gain capital. We know how to filter filter deals. We know how to talk to people, right? We know we have our finances in straights. So when we do go into a business or to a bank and Eric needs, he has a big idea and he needs X, Y, Z dollars. Usually it's in the millions now. The banks are like, oh, how much money do you need? We have a proven track record of paying people back. Our margins are where they need to be. We can overcome mistakes. People run their businesses too lean. They can't overcome anything. They're not They're not figuring it out. So the point is, is you got to jump all in. There's never, you, you do your due diligence, right? That's part of it. You jump all in every time. Yeah. I, I've never known, look at the major players, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, the people that I look up to. People, I'm just like, these guys are freaks. I'm trying to operate a company that yeah, they yeah. if they make yeah. what I make in gross revenue in an hour <laughs> that I make. Not even an hour, in minutes. Yeah. And then I make an entire year. Probably where I'm trying to end my goal at. Right, right. Right? Those guys are freaks, right? They do exactly what Eric did. They built a great team, and they're 60, 70, 80% of them. And they have a great cash flow resource. They raise money, and then they can go out and scale it. You have to scale it. You and I talked before we show, showed up on the show. You have to scale. Right. Being that one $2 million company is not fun. No. Hell no, it's not fun. You are you are the company. Right. right. You are the face. Right. You are the company. You are the advertising. You are the finance guy. You're, you're the, the guy the, in the jail cell. You're the operations. You're, you're involved in every one of those decision-making abilities every single day, all day long. Guess what? Not all those decisions are what your skill sets are good at, right? Being a small business and starting from the ground up, you're going to have to be involved in all those. So you're going to be deadly because you're going to be able to go in there and have conversations, intelligent conversations, and be able to have be able to communicate in those conversations when it comes to marketing and advertising and or finance and or accounting and or tax and or law or whatever because you started from ground up. You've had to learn all those things. That doesn't mean you're great at them. Oh, Absolutely. I suck at most of them. Yeah, right. You know, I'm I'm actually horrible horrible at like ninety percent of them. I think uh, that to a testament of what you guys are talking about, it's very important that you understand all those things, though. And when you come up, right, you understand a little bit about finance, a little bit about accounting, a little bit about operations, a little bit about logistics, or whatever is in your business, right? If you're able to to at least talk the lingo, right. In all of those little sections, you're going to be so much further ahead, right? Figure out what you'd like out of that group, right? Like me, I happen to like marketing, right? Figure out what you like. Figure out what you're good at. Stick to what you're good at. And the things that you're not good at, once you can support them, those are the people that you find, right? Like accounting was not my was not my forte, right? First person I found was accountant. You know what I mean? And now I'm like, whew, that's off me, Right? Now, next thing, right, is I'm spending all my time doing operations, right? Well, from if I'm going to think in a high level, I can't be. You can't be putting I, out fires I, all I, day. I can't be putting out fires all day. You like, right. can't be worried about a truck tire. Nope, yeah, you don't. Exactly, right? So then you got to you got to just replace what you're not good at or what, what frees up your time. And I think, and that's where it got to the point where you have to understand, and I think we talked about this offline at the beginning, but that's the 80, kind of, in my opinion, the 80-20 rule, which is, you know, if you can find somebody that does 80% of what you believe you can do, it, then be good with that, right? You're never going to be find somebody in your mind that is as good as, as good as you are, right? And if you can find that or whatever that threshold is, 75, 25, or 80, 20, find those people that are, are good in those sections, right? Replace them, put them in place, and then basically freeing your time up to be able to start scaling, which is what... You have so, to scale. Okay, so, so I want to know, so... You're, you're expected, and you guys clearly have done it. <clears throat> in three years, I'm particularly applying to your uh, ATP story. In three years, you learned all those aspects. No. Right? Not skill. Three, the first business I started was ATP. It was named Aim to Police. <laughs> I learned hard work, and I learned self-sacrifice. And I've learned all that, 
those skill sets that it takes to run a small business. I learned how to motivate somebody when you can't afford to pay them probably what they're worth. I learned how to put my vision into a team that I was not able to pay probably what they're worth and help them grow something that they believed in with me. I learned how to do a lot with very little. I learned how to spend every little dollar where it counts. I learned counting. I learned marketing. I got ripped off on accounting. I got ripped off on marketing, right? I was humbled over and over and over again to the point a lot of times I got back in a truck because I'd make mistakes, right? So the first business was all about skill set of hard work and understanding that you have to get on the ground floor and you have to be humble enough to work your ass off. Second business, had a little bit of capital, right? Had a vision, slowed it down a little bit as far as hard work goes. I was still working the hours. I was still putting the time in. I was still thinking about 24-7, but I was not in the weeds as much because I had a little bit of capital. I learned a life lesson. Capital's important. It helps a lot. You know, that's why they're company use outside money, private equity, money, you know, private private money funds that they're out there and banks, et cetera, right? You have to have capital. And then I got around, I ran out of capital. So I became, I made my first chunk of money when I was 25, right? When I, I remember I, like it was yesterday, I was playing basketball on a family vacation at Lake of the Ozarks and I showed my brother my bank account and he's like, holy shit, you made it. I was like, no, it's just getting started. Reset my goal, right? Mm-hmm. And reset the goal, and I took my money, and I spent it all in the first six months. And I spent it all on shipping containers. And I, and I didn't spend it all, but I spent a nice chunk of it. And I went all in again, right? And then I ran out of money. And I then went to the bank and borrowed a lot more money. I was like, I need – where I'm trying to go, I can't, I can't spend – I don't have enough money. So then I got some – Outside capital. And that outside capital came with a skill set that really taught me a lot of neat things, right? It taught me that they trusted me with their money, a.k.a. I trust Eric and Jeff and these guys with my money. They taught me that, hey, they let me do my thing, but how they gauged me was a very defined way of accounting and finance and reporting and those results. And that's how they gauged, and that's how I gauged these guys, is the reporting, but you have to have somebody putting together accurate reports, right, right? right? So having the understanding of the vision where you're wanting to go, having the capital to scale it, having developing the skill set. You don't wake up one day and be like, man, I can just scale a business. It takes time to learn those skill sets. And that's what a lot of people don't want to do. I see so many people that make 80, 100, $120,000, $150,000 a year. They're smart as shit. They're not willing to take one or two steps back for a shorter period of time to get to a life that they never thought they could live. What's Mm -hmm. the short period? Three to six years? Depends on how hard the work they put in. Yeah. Short-term sacrifice, long-term result. Right? It depends on how much work they're willing to put in. A lot of these guys, they make a lot of money and they have great ideas. They're not willing to step back. So they want to start these new companies exactly where they left off. Right? You can't do that. And that's where... I've tried to instill in my partners, and I've tried to show it by example, is when I started, or when Eric started OCSR, I didn't pay myself for the first, I think, two years. I think it was a year. A year. Okay. Yeah. Well, for a while. And then when I started Toughbox, I paid myself 50 grand. You know what I mean? And I don't think I took a paycheck for like the first three or four months. I never even took a paycheck for ATP. Yeah. Ever took a paycheck from ATP. I didn't pay myself $1 until I got my lump sum check when I sold. I was working in another job to <laughs> really? make in my, yeah. yeah. I didn't make one dollar off my company. I didn't pay myself one thing. I didn't take one one I owed a bit off that company. So both of us you started our first both of us started our first jobs, I guess, while we were working in some some way, shape, or form a corporate job of you know, his was a little more corporate than mine was, but But, but. it well, go ahead. No, I'm good. Well okay. so you started you you had a second job. You started your your business. Oh yeah, you had your primary job, and you started your side gig that turned into your your business that you sold. Yep. You were working your your standard corporate job, tried a business, it didn't work. Correct. So you had to go in full. And again, that's another topic that I love because I I did the same thing. I tried having a job and starting side of business. It was 
there wasn't enough focus on the business. But then whenever I got stuck to where I didn't have a choice, I had to make it work. That's where I, I feel like it kicked in for me. You got to be so hard headed. You almost got to be crazy. Yeah, you do. Because I'd do. get off work and that my job required me to travel. So I'd get off work at I'd get off the airplane and I'd say hi to Ashley and I would literally get in my car and I'd go suck out toilets for till 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I was cleaning my four rents or shop rents. So I'd go drive to my dad, dad's place at Harmony, go get in a truck and service toilets in Stillwater. Come back, wake up, go to the office, act like nothing happened. Finally, people started recognizing what I was doing. I looked like I was probably sucking out <laughs> toilets all night, right? And I was still a performer in that job. I still was a high performer in that career. Right. It's it's the mindset. It's the mindset that you're never going to give up. It's the mindset that get the hell out of my way. I'm going to make it. And and it's the it's you just have to you have to put yourself into such a trance that nobody's going to get in your path. Right. And people fold too easy. There's so many people that are weak. They're just weak. Just talk about that. And then they want what you have. Right, with half the amount of work. If Not none half, of the work. None of the work. None of the work. They want to start off on top. And my grandpa always tells me the only place you start off on top, son, is a hole digging a hole. Right? <laughs> That's and, a good one. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> one. <laughs> and he always tells me he's and and he's been successful in Tulsa in himself. And seeing seeing a family business grow and be successful and how that family works and how they continue to get along over a period of time has been neat to see. And I grew up in that world, but if I was going to give anybody advice, right now is the time to start a business. Not tomorrow, right now. And it does not matter how much income. It does not matter what the widget is. People are too worried about what people think of what they're doing. And their people are wanting to get in. I always call them the sexy businesses, right? Things that are sexy. And that would be from podcast, right? Like we're sitting here right These now. These microphones are sexy. Yeah. Or... You the know, business part, portion of it, not so much. You know, things that are... So this is an example. I'm not going to go into it crazy, but like Blue Studio is my example of where I just got started. Yep. I had some shitty microphones. Yeah. Things are an upgrade. This studio here is just an upgrade. But I want, I want to provide a place that has professional ex uh, uh, equipment and that's not too complex for use for anybody to just walk in, hit a button, record, share their voice, share their story, and walk out and publish it. That's my idea. No, you have to have a vision, and the vision will change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you get to upgrade microphones, and you're going to upgrade this, and you're going to upgrade probably your facility at one point. But you don't, so you don't think that you have to come out with the best equipment in order to just get started? I do now, but not. Because you have the because connections. But, and the right, because, because I can. can. Because he's so, going to levels. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, so now I'm like, okay, why am I going to go where I'm at now personally, right? Yeah. Is why would I go want to go buy a microphone that I'm already going to upgrade anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, but well, in starting out, that was not my mindset. And that's not where I'm saying you have to do. Right. What I'm saying is you have to jump in all in and you have to start now. Right. Because yeah. once right. you get in there, you're going to find a smart human being. And you don't have to be that smart because I'm not that smart. You just have to understand. You have to be willing to, willing, you have to be, you have to be being able to maneuver just enough to be like, hey, I thought I was going to make money over here, but this is where the money's at. I'm going to transition. Mm -hmm. Hey, I thought I was going to make money over here, but this is where the money's at. Or I'm just going to scrap this all together. This is not This is not a good deal, right? I, I was stupid. I didn't do my due diligence. Life lesson, right? You just have to jump in. People are, right now, you got to remember, think about how many people are getting bought out, acquired, or just plain shutting down their companies. There's a lot. It's crazy. Right? Think about well, trades. A couple of podcast episodes ago, there was, it was with Kyle. Uh, yeah. How many businesses filed for an LLC last year? Oh, man, I don't like remember the number. It was a lot. 20 million, 2 million. Here, I'll look it up and I'll come back. So people are not, things are way expensive. You're in the lawn care industry. So am I. Eric's in a lot of different industries. We're, I'm in the real estate industry. Jim, my brother and I, we build a lot of real estate together. Multifamilies, industrial facilities, self-storage facilities, all kinds of crazy stuff. We've developed neighborhoods. 1.2 million registered businesses in the last 18 months. I don't wow. know how many have shut down. That's a lot of registered. <laughs> Most of them don't even make it. Yeah, but right. point is, not, there's not things are so expensive. How do these people that are working jobs that don't go all in and don't have hard work ethic? I don't make it. Banks not going to loan them money. Yeah, right. right. So how do they scale? Right. 
There's the, I always ask bankers, I'm like, do you have a lot of young people come in there to try to borrow money? And I probably bank with, I bet we have 10 bankers walking through my office. A, I would agree. A month. I know. I bank with a lot of different banks on a lot of different real estate deals, from partnerships to what we got going on, to stuff my brother goes go, that's going on. But there's not a lot of young people borrowing money. Hmm. And if they're borrowing money, they're not borrowing the money that's going to keep those big fancy banks in place. Right. Right. Definitely right. not in the service business. Right. No. You know? Why? I don't know. Because it that's takes work. You know, it, and it's work. That's all it is. It's work. Pe- people. I always hear people. So, I can't so hire people. Want to start an e-commerce? I can't find anybody and... to hire. I can't find enough help. No. That's pretty easy to solve if you just. The, if you look at think about it. If you start driving around and you start looking at QT, <laughs> Quit Trip, you start looking at things that we use every day on Q, QT. That's in the gas station business, right? You start looking at Hampton, Hilton. You start looking at malls. I'm pretty sure there's people working at those cash registers. Last time I checked to McDonald's, besides COVID, those things are open, right? So finding good people, they're out there. You can get them. What those guys have done very well, and that we, the reason why they have been able to obtain them and keep them is they simplified their system where those guys feel successful. Mm-hmm. Little wins. Yeah. So you have the people are out there. And I think culture is a pretty big thing, too. Huge. And that's a good thing to kind of talk about a little bit. You know, we're always talking about revenue and, you know, and did that and the other. But, you know, what I thought, and, you know, Josh and I talk about all the time, which is I wanted to take a non-corporate style culture to what we're doing today, right? Is I don't there, – there's some bit of it that you have to have, right? But at the end of the day, I want it to be laid back, right? We don't have a very strict dress code, right? I mean, we the things that we do – we have a pickleball court at our office, Right. We have a we have a putting green in our office. We have an outdoor living area with speakers and and, and all kinds of stuff. Right. So the, we can bring our people together. Right. And feed them and bring their families. And and, you know, everybody is a cohesive group in in even the even the lowest in person. That's a yard hand for me. I know his name. I probably work beside him. Right. And it's just a different style. Right. So I think a I think what makes us kind of successful or more successful as far as in a service business as, as others is I put the time into these people, right? And, and I do care, right? It's not just I show them that I care. I do care, right? And then we set up our systems and we set up the company so that it feels that way, right? We do things that nobody else does. Like we provide health care. From the provide, lowest level? From the lowest level. We provide health care. We provide dental. We provide vision. We provide 401k matching at 4% max. Wow. Right. So all the just and those are just the basics. Uniforms paid. I mean, I could probably go down laundry. I forget. Right. But at the end of the day, pay for all their boots, pay for their boots. We give them boots voucher every year. Right. So what I'm saying is, is that. I I'm like a two way street, like I love my revenue. Let's not get that twisted. Right. And you have to have the revenue to be able to give what I'm able to give. Right. Let's get that straight. No revenue, no business. No revenue, no business. Right. Not a, not a lot of revenue. Not able to pay for uh, health care and digital <laughs> right. vision. And right. you see what I'm saying? The but, margin. <laughs> or, yeah, margin. Right. But, uh, you know, all that's relative to, you know, you got to have what I was going to say was you got to have the margin. Right. To be able to support all these things. But you got to have the prices in the right place. Right. To be able to meet the margin, to be able to pay for the stuff for the individuals and to be able to create the culture that you want. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's kind of like a top level down of the system that I was, I thought in my head and then we were able to put it into play. Right. Got to have, got to have the top line sales, got to have the margins, right. Got to take the money, got to have the good people and to get the good people, you have to have a good culture and you got to be able to provide, uh, you have to be able to provide what other people are not able to provide. Right. In the service business is a yard guy. I promise you there's probably, if there is one, I'd be surprised that provide healthcare, dental, vision, 401k right here in Tulsa. And that can go in there and talk to you personally. Yeah, and then can come into my office at any point in time, sit down, and if he's got problems, I'll listen to him. You know what I mean? Well, the other day I was sitting in my office, and I, I overlooked the pickleball court and basketball court, right? And the other day I saw two of our salesmen playing a game, uh, Devin and Jordan, Jordan yeah. at 1 o'clock, I think it was one thirty, playing a game of pickup basketball. I don't care. Because right. at the end of the day, everything is KPI. Everything has a KPI. Everything has a system. Everything we grade people, not off how many hours they're putting in, off their performance. performance now, granted, it translates the amount of hours you put in 
sometimes, if not all the time, will definitely reflect on that grading scale, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you need a break, we're not going to be corporate. Go walk right. around. Right. Our, yeah. our CFO walks around randomly and reads his books. He needs a break. I don't yeah. ever ask him what he's doing or tell him to get back at his desk. If people need to go take something from their family, they go. Now they let their direct supervisor, it's part of the system, let them know. But we have those flexibilities in our office. I mean, hell, we got three bars. Not be- <laughs> not out of... Just in case you didn't like the seating at one. A- <laughs> For this one doesn't have that kind of vodka. Like, <laughs> oh, I need whiskey today. <laughs> I mean, not because we're alcoholics. is because if if I want to sit down in the evening time and have a, everything's calmed down and I want to sit down and have a genuine conversation, we're all human beings. We're men. We can have it. Or women. Absolutely. We can have a drink with you and be responsible. Right. You know what I mean? This oh, is yeah. not... Corporate culture. Right. And tell me what you're thinking. Well, businesses have had to change like that over the years. They used to be all corporate. Like that was the way that mm-hmm. like our parents grew up, our grandparents, like it was all strict. And I think there was a lot of what the World War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, like all these wars and stuff just kind of caused a lot of people in their cultures and stuff to be strict. And I think maybe over the last few 10 years, 20 years, it's been a little bit more Lenient, especially with the younger generations coming out There's no and demanding war. a different kind of Disciplining culture. Disciplining young men. Hmm. Well, that too. Um, <laughs> cultures of and expectations have changed. Yeah. Well, too many people are trying to find a way out. They just need somebody to give them a path. Right. There's a lot of good people that have a that can provide a lot of good skill sets if you put them in the right climate. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I've screwed up a lot of great employees. Oh. I, I love that up, you admitted that. I put him in there. I'm like, I just screwed that guy up. I either changed his pay too fast. Put him in the wrong because role. Put him in the wrong role and they kept him there too long. Resources. Or I didn't give enough some support and love. I've messed up salesmen. I've messed up my fair share of great salespeople, sales staff. And I always tell him, I'm like, hey, look, you really need to think about your commission structure before you start giving to somebody because it's all right to up it. It's not okay to... Take it away. Take it away. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. You're They're like, yeah, I'm doing good. But the second you're like, hey, you're sucking, I'm going to have to take it back. That's a whole different. Or not just sucking or I'm paying you too much and my margins can't support your pay. And yep. because I didn't know, I didn't have my finances straight, so I never understood how much money I'm making. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And now deal. as a business leader, I have to make tough decisions to stay in business. That goes back to the hardships, right? So, and learning all those things. So I want to bring up, you just brought up a, a, a good concept of, of sometimes supporting your your people right we had a uh, something happen to us just maybe last week where we had a, one of our main foremans really good we, he, we just hired him on this the beginning of the season and you can definitely tell he's made a difference in that department but he's telling us that he's thinking about leaving at the end of this year What's his name and number? Oh, I can't tell you. <laughs> I wish I could, but but, but I, I tried to get this guy for two years. No, and finally, I was like, dude, what's your number? I know what you're worth. I know what your skill sets is. And he he definitely proved it. But he came to us, and he's like, hey, I, I just I think I'm going to leave. I'm not very comfortable. You know, I'm just not. I was like, hey, I, first of all, if you got to take care of yourself first, whatever that is. And if we're not the people for you, I understand that. I hate that. But you got to do you first. And I, I get that 100%. You know what I always ask? And I do this. I try to do it every single time. If somebody leaves me, and we don't have a very high turnover, I always want to know why. Well, okay, so that's what, exactly what I said. I said, why? What, what's going on? You know, did somebody offer you more? Or or what's the deal? He's like, honestly, we've been here this year. He's like, and I understood what I was coming into. You guys told me, hey, I need to form. I need a strong foreman to really help train these guys and really do this. And you guys said, like, he's like, well, I've been here this season, and I've already lost three people. And I said, okay, I understand. I said, what, what's wrong? He's like, I just, I don't like the feeling that those people are leaving because of me. I, I just don't like it, dude. Nobody, and, I, and that's where it clicked to me. And I was like, of course, you're human. You're, you're just like the rest of us. You want to feel like people like you, people love you, whatever. And you never feel that way if people keep, continue to leave because of certain things. So I sat down with him and I'm like, what, 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 what's the issue? He's like, I just feel like I, I'm a dick. Like, I just feel like that's the way you've put me here in this position. And I sat down with him, and I'm like, okay, well, let's let's overlook at our company, our core values, and kind of what really matters to us. You're the first one that shows up every single day. You're the first one that's out of the office every single day. Your equipment, you check every single day to make sure your oils are up to level, your air, your tires are aired up, everything, to a T, every day, before your help even gets here. And then you get mad because your help shows up late. They're, they're slowing you down. You're literally doing everything we asked you to. And because of that, these people are leaving because they don't like 
the standards that you're trying to implement that we we want those those standards and i get to talk to him a little bit more a little bit more and it, it comes down he just feels defeated he just feels like he's been defeated at the end of this year and this now said you know what we could pay him more to keep him to stay on we could do a million things we, we could really try to do to keep him to stay on but instead i just brought him in and i sat him down and said hey look first of all i understand it feels like shit to feel like people are leaving because you. I've had the time where one person literally came, put the credit card on my desk, and told everybody else that I won't come back because of that asshole. I was that was me. I was gonna felt like it felt like crap. I said, and I know that you're feeling the same way. I said, so let's fix that. You've gone all year. You've done phenomenal in the things that we wanted you to do. What are the three to five things we can work on this winter? to set up the processes or whatever it is so we can train whoever it is for the next year. So that way you don't leave. So that way you feel like, hey, these people, it not only are is you, but you have the backup from us who helped you create these processes. So what we did was we, we invested a little bit of time in our people, right? We said, hey, instead of letting you just leave and offering you more money, we're going to offer you resources. We're going to offer you backup. What does that look like? And not only are we going to offer you, let's make this plan yours. So that way you have more buy-in to this. And after that conversation, then he comes to us and he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, this mower is kind of acting up and the AC in my truck hasn't worked in a couple months. I'm like, dude, you could have said that a couple months ago. Like, we would have fixed this. Like, we would have we addressed this. But because he was feeling defeated, he felt like he couldn't talk to anybody. And he was just like, hey, yeah. he waited to the last minute. There would have been something that a turnover. It would have affected the company negatively because then now we don't have that strong foreman that gives us the confidence to take on the bigger jobs or whatever it is that, that comes on. But at the same time, you got your turnover rate, and now you got to deal with. Now you got to figure out the next foreman for next year. That we all know, everybody starts poaching towards the end of the season. Everybody's looking for their new jobs. What's I know his how name it goes. And number. I, I, <laughs> I know how it goes. You think I'm not looking at your guys at Quick Trip? <laughs> My guys don't go Quick, quick Trip. What? They pull up at our fuel station. I've seen them at Walmart cleaning. I'm just stopping. That's hey man, contract. here's my card. I know. I sound like, here's my card. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but with that being said, like I said, there was a time where you could, the pay could do something, sure. But ultimately, you, I, I decided to take a different route and invest in our people. Because we already pay a decent amount. That was the whole reason. We, we A lot of people are like, oh, I don't have the infrastructure. And we have the people because we pay good. At least we think we do. And the people around us think we have a good culture and pay decent enough. But it was one of those times where everybody just happens to think, oh, it's always money. It is money. But sometimes they're human, too, and they just feel defeated. And, and people want to be surrounded by a team of like and people that lift them up. If this guy who came in the summer, the beginning of summer, has done good on our part as the owners, we need to let him know that that's good. We also need to let him know that, hey, we don't like that you feel this way because, hey, we're all human. Nobody likes feeling that way. What can we do to help you make sure this doesn't happen in the future? The last two weeks has been phenomenal on his end. Just because he felt like he was actually hurt out. And not only actually felt, but we're actually sitting down with him and saying, hey, what are these things that – you know, that's to you is like, why, why are we having to teach this crap? But he's wondering the same damn thing. He's like, why am I having to teach this crap? Can you guys help me out? And it's like, well, we took the time to say, hey, what is it going to take to get you to stay, to make it feel like you're not the one running these people off? And, and if somebody leaves, we can just at least have the backup of our hands and say it wasn't just you. We, we encourage that. Yeah. Um, I'd rather just overpay. Why, why would you rather overpay? Because in the, it costs so much money to retrain and rehire. Yeah, I was gonna say that. So we don't. We, we just go in there. We're the highest paid people in our class. Period. Poor parties, mowers. It doesn't matter what your skill set is. So you think if you are, and and I love I love that I get to ask this. So you think overpaying? Not overpaying. Okay, n- not not overpaying. Highly competitive. Okay, so so like OFS look, starts we're, at we're like eighteen dollars an hour. We're gonna put or more or more. Okay, yeah. so with that being said, and we have competitors starting their mower guys out at twelve to fifteen. Twelve to thirteen. Yeah, with no benefits. With no benefits. We pay that's for all true. their clothing, all their shirts, that's all true. their clothes, all their all their benefits. It's funny you say because that's like one of one of the biggest things that people are like. Wait, you have benefits over here? That's like, starting. Yeah, benefits. That's starting. I mean, you don't get like great, awesome uniforms, but you get five shirts. We got multiple people go. for us that make over hundred thousand dollars a year. Low, See, low, all. lower, lower tier, not lower tier, different skill sets. Right. Ground level employees making 60, 70, 80, 100, 60. But they bring their value. If they, no, they, they, they fit into the system or they don't. Okay. okay. It's not value. You create it's, the system that's going to create the value for you. And you find that you put the people into that system. And then you overpay. You pay highly competitive. 
Yeah. And then you, they figure out, you figure out, and they figure out they're going to meet the expectations given. I see. And we're a high capacity, high volume right. provider, right? right? We want to provide excellent service. That's our standard, period. If you can provide that, we, you'll be paid very well. Excellent pay. With very well benefits, with good Bonuses benefits, with and... vacation starting and all the things that you are not going to get at the next job, but you have to perform. So, and, and I'm bringing, again, sorry guys, but I'm going to totally just pick your brain here. Um, in my perspective, I'm not set up like you guys, right? So I can't just... You're going to have higher turnover. Uh, right. I, I can't pay as much as you guys. You can pay right? more. Well, and... Because you can't... You're right. At a small business, you can't afford to retrain and rehire. Oh, I agree. It, it cripples you even more. Right. Then if Eric, yeah, it's like the opposite. If Eric mindset. afford lost a guy or two with having 50 guys just on OCSR, he can afford to lose a guy or two. Right. And backups and backups and backups. Right. Plus, he's willing to get in the truck. Right. Right. As a small business, you can't afford to have that guy quit you. Right. You can't afford to have that guy walk in there and hand you your keys during high season that you are depending on. So you have to get that guy to stay. You have to over communicate with him. You have those systems are more important than ever. You have to pay that guy well because that guy is everything to you. Right. Versus Eric, that guy is everything to Eric, but he has multiple of those guys. Right. Right. right? But the systems that you put those guys in. Or everything is yeah. going to make them feel more successful. That's right. And the system is That's not the them. Key. The system is the level and standard you want your company to operate within, right? So you pay your over, you pay your guys very high. If, if your industry standard is 16, 17, you pay them 18, 19. How much does it cost you? And how much time do you have to take out of your day to train, retrain that guy and to get to know that guy and learn how to push that guy and right. all those things that you're going through right now? You didn't want to lose that guy because you're smart enough as a business owner understand it's going to take so oh, much yeah. time to replace it's him. not worth losing him there's no Plus way your customers get to know him and right. they get to like him right. or they don't like right. him right. whatever the case may be but you at least know what he's operating on so i started out thinking like you and i'm not saying what you're thinking is wrong right right but i'm just saying is my mindset is completely different it's changed a while a long time ago we go in there we pay our guys well we provide them the best equipment but you guys have the systems in place to help the systems grade everybody right which you helps know, and our... we used, you know, like, and I'll elaborate a little bit. You know, what I did was I used the people as we grew, put my brain and his brain and the people that were doing it, right? It was me first, and then it was somebody else, right? But I integrate them so much, and like I say, I have that culture of care and taking care of these guys, and we're all a team. Everybody's a team member. They're not they're my, my employee. You know right. what I mean? Like, right. And that's how I feel. We don't even call them employees. Right. We no. call them team. We're right. a team. So what I'm saying is, is I use their knowledge as they're doing it and we're growing my knowledge, his knowledge, everybody's knowledge to perfect that system. And then these guys buy into it better right. because they help create it. That's exact. That's exactly what, what the saying? whole idea is, is these guys have, I'm a business owner. There's a million things I'm working on. Yeah. I've been out there. I've mowed. I've done all that. I will do it if I have to. But the reality is I'm not out there every day. They yeah. are. So like you said, it, something happened earlier this year. We bought a dump trailer and the guys in the field are like, about time. It's like, well, you guys could have said that. Yeah. Like I would have tried harder to get this dump trailer had you guys been bitching at me for the yeah. past six months. And it's like, but again, you're taking that guy that bottom level apparently, but they have better ideas sometimes. And that's, that's whole, my whole idea with this guy is, Hey, what's your ideas? What are you thinking? Because yes, I could pay you more, but it, right now it, it, to me, it felt like you just felt defeated. You well, know? you, you start thinking about who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Your drivers, your, your people that are working, your, your workers, right? Not, not, we're workers too. Yeah, yeah. But your right. people that are actually it. making you money, mm -hmm. right? Our most important people you have in your company, period. I can replace Eric. I don't want to. I can't go replace a fleet of truck drivers overnight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I can. Re they can replace me, but they can't. I can't replace nineteen guys that get on lawnmower overnight. Mm -hmm. And if I lose nineteen guys that get on lawnmower overnight, I lose all my customers overnight. You have to make these guys feel successful. The only way you can do that is you have to put realistic expectations in front of these guys, like Eric does, sitting down with your people and letting them letting them help you understand what are realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. Almost every first conversation I, that I talk to somebody, whether I'm hiring or I'm in the room or whether I just see him for the first time, I tell them that I have an open-door policy. Mm -hmm. Where if your boss is not getting something done that you know needs to be done, please Go step into him. my office and tell me about it. 
Mm-hmm. After you already went to them. Yeah, after you've already went to them, right? And they've had their chance to do the right thing. Right, right. right. Supposed to be doing their job. Yeah, supposed to be doing their job. And, and I say that to every single person. Eric did a great thing this, I think it was a year and a half ago, or a year ago. I mean, a year ago. He put in a very uh, innocent maneuvered, but KPI system for his truck drivers. Yeah. And just... I didn't do it myself. I got good people, and they mm-hmm. helped. I helped with and it. We, we he went out and picked... Uh, to be honest with you, we were... We were we were under we want to blow this thing up. So Eric was like, "Let's." Eric and I sat down. Let's go find somebody that's unbelievable. So we headhunted people. We were flying them in from Boston and where else did we fly these people? Texas and all over. And we're talking about we're going to pay this guy, somebody that's already been there, done that, take us to the next level. And unfortunately, fortunately for us, God had a little bit different plan, and. We found another gentleman that just fell in our lap and probably something we could probably afford a little bit better, right? And he had a lot of industry experience in this region. And he put in there and he sat down with Jeff or uh, Eric and helped put these KPIs in place. And when we have a different, different, I'll tell you how fast it can impact your business. We had a different operator. We were doing eight to nine pulls a day, right? And now we're doing. 12 to 14. So Pulls a 14. day per truck. That's almost double the revenue. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. With the same amount of fleet. Same amount of yeah. payroll. Same That's amount what of our everything. employees are doing. Wow. They're making more money because they get graded off their performance. They get right. bonus off their performance. Yeah. So now our only our guys making more money. They feel more successful. Right. It creates a competitive edge within because everybody wants everybody to be. Everybody wants to be number one. They, yeah. And they it's, it's right there. We just put a TV on our new office. When you walk into the front door, Eventually, it's going to have all oh, who's number one, who's mm-hmm, number two, and mm-hmm. who's number three. Who sucks that day? Right. And who's the king daddy? And they talk about it when we run through the office all the time. So right. these back to what I was. My point was is know your audience. People are not trying to get the truck driver guy is not trying to be you and I. That's trying to live the life that you and I are. They're not trying to go after jet money. Mm-hmm. They want to be fulfilled. They want to be respected. Mm-hmm. They want to be feel important. They want to feel like their voice is heard. In our company. Eric and I's company and our 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 we 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 try to make that known. You are important. Your voice does matter. It probably matters more than our managers, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, open door policy after you go through the chains of command. Then come to us and we will correct the problem if it needs to correct. There's always two sides of the story, right? Right, always. But having that culture where they can go to the top line, top of the top. I have people that surpass Eric all the time. Now, Eric and I have been around each other. I can call mm-hmm. bullshit on half of it, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Some of it is they're just they're scared to go, Eric. Right. He's right. a top cheese. You know, he's a top G. You know what I mean? He's the people and looking at herself differently. Right. People don't always feel comfortable going into me and talking to me. I don't think I'm a goofy redneck. Right. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So I don't probably take myself as serious as my hundred plus employees do. Right. Right. You know what I mean? I walk into the office, I can already tell that people shaping up a little bit, not because of what I demand and I let people know who I am. Half people don't even know who I am. It's just because it, the word gets around. You don't have to tell people what you are and what you do around the company. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? But you have to have that. Eric's done a very good job on it where people feel comfortable enough to go talk to him. You know what I mean? I'm not on the ground level, so people really don't know who I am. Half time, they think I'm. They don't know who I am in the company at this point. So it's, this the shirt, it's, uncle? it's the shirt that gets <laughs> your attention. Your the shirt. <laughs> That's what it is. He dresses nice. Everybody's like, "Dang, like, I like important. that shirt." Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, exactly. People are like, "Okay, I don't know what he does. I know, but I know who he is." Yeah, right. But I don't know what he does. You know what I mean? And right. all I'm really doing at this point is love and support and and give him money. Right, and not giving money. I shouldn't. That sounds too no. But too, but again, you we've explained through the podcast. You, you've gone to levels, right? Yes. You guys have both gone to levels, Correct. and and the whole reason of bruising business is to get people that insight from start to finish. We literally just finished a podcast with someone who's just starting their business, right? Like this month, like this month, which is fantastic because then they have a whole different mindset, right? And then you guys are literally telling us the stories of how you guys started in small. And as you're building those skills, you're building those, you know, there's the whole idea of if I just had a million dollars, you'd be broke tomorrow anyways, because you don't, you haven't earned that million dollars. You don't know how to, what to do with that million dollars. You guys have gone through your steps to earn that million dollars. So now when you win a million dollars, like, well, I'm not going to waste this off. I'm going to figure it out some way to make it make sense for me. 
I you, think you guys you are actually, going those levels. I think you actually called on me at ATP. Yeah, I chased your ass for 10 years. Yeah, he, <laughs> Bra Braden actually called on me when I had a trailer house, my first real yard in Tulsa. That was my first yard in Tulsa. It was about 2014 or 2015. You're only a year. And I had rat, it was so bad. I had my secretary had rat turds. I'd had one, I had a good customer on one time. <laughs> Call me and they're like, hey, you're a good story. I just they called me personally. Hey, just to let you know, I just opened up your invoice and the invoice had pee on it and a rat turd pop out of it. The trailer house that you called on was so infested with rats that we would we would have to like eat our food up because you'd see them run across your desk and it'd come oh, across. Wow. It, that's how broke we were. And the shop we were trying to operate at, it when it rained. It'd get all of our toilet paper wet, and we'd run all of our toilet paper. Oh, that's so we, funny. We kept it in trucks. You know, but yeah. I, you've been calling. He's been calling on me as a uh, to get my business when he very first started. Yeah. So how long ago did you sell ATP? I sold ATP. Twenty sixteen. Yeah, twenty six. Twenty seventeen. Twenty sixteen. Did did the name stick around with ATP? Uh, they I saw carried the, it for a few years, but you then still see the truck driving around. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is. We started in what we called our office, which was like some portable building that we like built out to work for us. And we had an ATP porta potty well, way out in Hectorville. One lonely porta potty, which I'm not gonna lie, every time this guy came out, I'm like, they're losing money on that. Every time they're coming out to <laughs> it's clean probably that toilet, him. they're losing <laughs> well, money. Well, when did you start? 2018. So it would have been uh, after uh, you yeah, sold. Okay. Right. Yeah. It would have been after you sold. But I'm pretty sure it was ATP because every time the guy was awesome, by the way. I don't even remember his name. He was a good guy. But oh. every time it came out, I was just like, man, there's no way they're making any money off of us. I mean, they have to drive 30 minutes up the fucking hill. Well, we don't his... realize there's these random toilets, hence why we're buying the company that we're trying to buy, that you just don't know about. And if you get <laughs> on our map, 20 years. if you get up on our map and every map is geolocated on every one of our assets, if you get on there, it's just literally nuts. Of how... We have thousands and thousands of assets out now. Hmm. scattered out throughout the states and i mean thousands and you get on there and you and it I always kind of do it just for out of just like sometimes i'm just like where is all my stuff mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and i hit zoom out zoom out zoom out or i don't because i don't know the word system nowadays but <laughs> they do and i'm like holy crap we got stuff everywhere I, we have stuff out here how are we making money out here right and they have their own little routes and their system over there We'll tell you exactly how much you're making per route. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I think the last piece that we haven't really talked about that I use on, almost on a daily basis is understanding how much it costs you to run your stuff, right? Run your equipment, right? And, and it mine, adjusts. And it does adjust. And we, I run it. I think every quarter I, I change it. Like if the fuel price changes, that number changes, right? So you have to have a, a good accountant, number one, but – you have to be able to understand your your what I call the run rate, right? Because everything relies on this truck going from point A to point B, dumping something, right, and coming back, right? And if I know what all my cost is for this guy to run for one hour, and I can figure out from A to B to C back to A what that cost me, I know what to charge you. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just literally as rudimentary as that. And that's what we're, so, Eric and I were telling you earlier that scales everything. Right. But you never be correct, too. If you're, right. If you're – Porta potties is a great example. If you're servicing 50 porta potties per route, you're, you have certain fixed costs. Mm -hmm. Your fixed costs are your truck payment, the person in the truck, mm -hmm. your insurance. Your insurance. Then you have these variable expenses, your right? Fuel. fuel, whatever it may be. There's a bunch of them, right? Mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, what happens if I could get 80 restrooms and consolidate my routes? Mitigate all those. Well, losses. now I can squeeze you out of business because now I'm my cost per toilet to service is way less. Yep. Yeah. Versus if you don't have the scale, your distance between restrooms and restrooms is an example in this case. There's a lot of, and all, pretty much all of our industries are all about scale. Right. We don't want to get into something we can't scale because we just know that one to two, one to three million dollar business, it's a grind. Right. It's right. always a grind, but it's a real grind. You don't have to do it by yourself so much once you get when over I that When I see somebody that's been in business for yourself and they've been doing one to three million dollars a year, I would say that guy's Teflon tape. That guy's been in the grind for a while, and he's tired. He's tired. Right. He's tired. He's been ups and downs with employees. He's been right. trucks falling apart. This. He's been in the ditch. He's been in the office. He's he's been in the grind. When I see that guy's around that five ten million dollar business, he has some good people around him. He can go take that vacation. He can. He's making money. 
he can go diversify and or he can put the money in his pocket and go live in a nicer neighborhood or whatever he likes to do. Go on a hunt trip, whatever it may be. I see that guy's doing that 15, 10, 15, 20 million dollar mark. I would say 10 to 20. It's kind of that next level. The gaps get bigger too, mm-hmm. right? Three to five, one to three, three to five, five to 10, 10 to 20 is kind of my next gap where I'm looking, not looking at personally, but like I'm starting to see people if I'm around or hitting those levels. They're investing. They're playing the game now. Everything's system. Mm-hmm. If you're not, if you don't have systems in place, you'll never make it to five. If you don't recalibrate your systems, you'll ma- never make it to ten. If you don't hire great people, you'll never scale past ten. Period. So I, I've got a question for you guys, and I, I I think I know this answer, but this is a great question. I think for anybody in the service industry, you said it earlier. There's some hard cost to every business. Your overhead cost for everybody watching. How do you guys figure those costs? Because I'll tell you how I figure, and I believe to be the correct route, the correct way, but I could be completely wrong. So the way I would do it in my overhead cost to figure out, again, what you're going to charge your customer, you've got all your monthly payments, correct? You've got your monthly salaries, your, all your, or your hard costs that you have to have, your marketing, your insurances, all that, right? And then you got to figure out what your, in my eyes, what how many employees you're trying to get, how many working hours you have per year. So, guys, everybody, this is a math equation. It's this simple, at least I think. All, how many hours you're going to work per year, right? Now, if you're going to have overtime in there, you got a budget for your overtime hours. And then you figure out, so, for instance, I'll, I'll try to do this math really easy. you got a $100 piece of equipment per se, and you've got one person that's going to work, we'll say, 50 hours for that week. That cost is $2 per hour for that piece of equipment. So now you have to figure out what your margin is on that, that you want to make on your on your payroll and so on and so forth. But the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because, again, a lot of people I've found, and, and I'm just now learning this, they don't know how to figure out their numbers, how to even start there. What advice or what what could you, I mean, again, it's a very basic equation. Back to continuing, we sound like a broken record because I've been preaching this to Eric from day one. If you don't start with accurate numbers, you will not get an accurate output. So, yeah, you can sit there and run all your numbers if you want. I don't know if your numbers are correct or no. I'm assuming they are. If you don't start with accurate numbers, the output, when you hit enter and you get your formula, it's accurate. irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Which This is- was something that we worked on when we worked together. Remember the conversation about numbers? And we were like, well, how much are we making from residential versus commercial? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, how much are we making per one of these dumpsters? And is each one of those residential or commercial? Okay, then what about septic? Okay, and then what about time of day? Okay, when did those ads run? Okay, when did the, the sales peak? When did the calls decline? Like that whole being able to pull that data between each one of those is, is so important. Yeah. yeah, so to me, and again, this is just my opinion, but it's it's I was able to basically kind of what he said, take those hard costs, right, and give it a, we'll call it a good college try for a piece for a period of time. But I took the number that I thought it was and I added to it for a variance, if you will, right? And I think that was how I began until I had an accountant that was good enough to give me the exact data that I needed to be able to figure out what the cost per hour is with everything added up around me to include fuel spend, you know what I mean, to insurance, to the penny. But now we have this other thing now, the way we're set up, we have corporate overhead costs. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Everything, so now we get to, corporate overhead costs, This is where everything. the scale comes in play because now we got to take all these high-power accountants and all that, these high-power finance, my role, my salary, and we get to take that and we get to divide that by seven companies and pro order portion of formula that we derived. So now I get cheap. Yeah, and that's what makes it – that's kind of what we we kind of brainchilded, which is, you now know – We go hire better people, spread the costs over a lot of companies that are successful and growing, and yeah. now we get all this high output of data – because we got all these high output people. And now I got four accountants and it cost me 60 XY. grand a year for four accountants or whatever. Because Instead of, of paying one, 80, 80 grand a year for one. Yeah. Okay, 80. Six, or whatever it is, or 120 or 180. Or exactly. Yeah. So we got high, high output people that give us high output data. And we get to take that those costs and divide it by the amount of companies that we own in a pro out of portion. Yes. And that's, our, that's our corporate overhead expenses is what we call in our company, and, and there's a line item for that. And as I, that company, as those continue to grow, they continue to get spread out and pro out a portion. And then we can go like what we're doing right now. We're looking at payroll. We spend. We use a com, we use a PEO firm, and 
so many people that are listening, they understand what a PEO is. So we used a PEO because it takes a lot of pressure off us on a lot of other things. It's expensive. So we're spending a little over $100,000 a year. It's closer to $200,000 a year cutting payroll. Well, it's time to bring that in-house. So now we can save. Even if we hired a backup of a backup, we can save over $100,000 a year. That's true cost, right? And you take all those savings and divide that by the amount of companies and product a portion of what they're saving, your margins just went up. Because we have the volume, a.k.a. the scale. You have to scale. Say 100000 a month? No, our payroll, just to cut payroll checks. Is, is that what you would couple, save? No, $100,000 a year just to cut uh, payroll checks. Okay. That's our expense. Hey, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. He, he's just saying on top payroll. of the know, payroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just to pay somebody to cut the payroll, another company is a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Just in their fees. Yeah. I can bring those fees in-house, not assume any of those fees, and have extra backups in the office. And still save over a hundred thousand dollars. That's something I was working on here lately. You know, and divide and save, put that cost savings on all of our business lines. And now what? Our point, it, Eric's might go up 0.5. Being in a conference room while you guys do this shit has got to be a blast. We do it every day. It's just like a game. It's creating every day. those processes. It's just fun for us. Yeah. yeah. And then we look at stupid things. Like now we're like, oh man, we look, I look at, so what I do is I have like a global financial statement. So I get everybody's finances combined at one. So I have, and then I have Gene, our accountant, pull up certain finances, like certain categories I want to see. IT, uniforms, uh, payroll expense, fuel, whatever the categories may be. And then I'm like, okay, our number one spend is fuel this month or payroll. Okay. Eric, are you running as efficient as you can? You know what I mean? Okay. Payroll's kind of one of those deals that there's ups and downs, right? But let's look at things, hard costs, right? Uniforms. Well, we're using Unifirst. first. They do a good job. Well, how can I cut that? We're spending like four hundred grand a year in uniforms. Let's cut that in half. How? How well, do we do that? That yeah. goes straight to the bottom straight line. To the, straight to the bottom mm-hmm. line. Buy out the do volume to do it now. Marketing, advertising. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You experience that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it comes and goes. Yeah, it comes yeah. and goes. You know what I mean? And that passes on to everyone else. Yeah. Exactly. All my other vendors. Yeah. So. Uh, all these things. It's pros and cons. You know, I hate to do that with people that's done us a good job, but it's not that we don't have a great relationship still. It's just I had to make a good business decision on behalf of all the business lines. Uh, payroll is a big one right now. It's a hot topic. Let's bring that in-house. We have the office. We have the expertise. We need it. HR, safety. Safety is our next big one. We're going to hire a full-time safety guy. We have a massive fleet now. I say massive. It's a small fleet compared to a lot, but it's a decent-sized fleet. I think we're going to hit... I think next year we'll hit 100 vehicles flowing down the road. Tires. We spent 100, and just his business line alone was like 180 grand a year in just tire fixings yeah. that's and another, tires. That's another one that I'm changing and bringing in house. I got a mounted tire program that we're about to start. Mechanic. Nice. We yeah. just started our mechanic shop. We're spending 120 to $160 an hour in a mechanic shop. I could pay a mechanic 35 bucks an hour. At the best, and give them all the lifts and everything else, and I just charge my mechanic out to each I know, business line. I know a shop that wants to sell if you want the equipment. <laughs> might be interesting. Like like ten lifts and all the parts. Where's the shop at? I might just buy the shop. It's here in Tulsa. Hmm. But they've been wanting someone to buy them out. Hmm. I don't need to get that. Is that how I think I'll, it is? I'll broker the deal and give me a commission. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, when you scale, <laughs> and this goes back to what continue to sound like a broken record. You have to scale. Right. That conversation we had earlier, you have to get that mindset. Just scale it because life will get a lot more fun, a lot more exciting. You'll gain a lot more confidence. You'll push yourself to something you'll never thought you could push yourself to. And you're going to impact a lot more people in a positive way. Okay, so final question. Um, this is each individually for you guys. Were you lucky or smart? Both. All. Both. Hard work, determination, luck, and and just putting in just, just luck. I, luck and hard work. Never give up. You know, you give up, you're done. You're done right then. Right? Mm-hmm. You just wake up the next day and you just restart. Hey, then that sucked. So, so <laughs> I want to I want to say that we started with the podcast from almost bankruptcy now to 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 what you built now. You've asked a great question, which I believe he answered almost perfectly. When you were on brink of bankruptcy. Where are you going to give up? 
Hell no. See, there's the answer. Give up there's the blood answer blood right blood there. Blood. You're like, e- even though you literally knew your back was up against the wall, and there was like, you're like, I don't know That's what I'm going to do. That's why I went after Eric. You're right. But, but exactly. You knew, uh, well, the well, only option is out. Up. I didn't know if he was going to give up. Right. To be honest with you, I didn't know if he was going to give up. I went after Eric for one purpose, because he just went through the hardest time he's ever been through in his life. And if he can get past that grind, and he's willing to sacrifice everything, quit his job, start this new company, he just freaking folded. Mm -hmm. Right? Not because probably what he did or he didn't do. There's probably a little bit of all that, right? When you reflect on yourself. He just folded. He didn't ever file bankruptcy. I said, I will not be your partner. We're not going to file bankruptcy. That's not an option. And he worked through it. I mean, we've had these conversations. And he got through it, and he was willing to sacrifice everything again and go all in. I was like, he's going to freaking be a great partner. Right, We're going right. to fuck up this <laughs> <Right>. world. <laughs> hey, and lastly, I heard you say something earlier that I thought was kind of interesting, is that whenever I made that transition, my wife was pregnant. So oh, yeah. I went, it's always something like that that gives you a swift kick in the ass, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it, you're and, back and, against the wall. And, and I went directly is, into right. the, the hardest time we'd ever had, which was I just started learning something. I'd never done it before. Into a, uh, well, he mentioned earlier, a turnaround, which is what we're about to go into. And I literally worked for n- almost 90 days in a row. We had the baby in the middle of the turnaround. Oh, man. Okay. And then I went home for like two days or I can't even remember. It was a blur. And then it was right back at it. And I'm sure my wife, bless her heart, thank you for not, for giving me a little bit of a chance a little bit, to keep going because I'm sure that was tough, you know? Oh, yeah. And, uh, but I had to get right back at it and, uh, or because there was no other option, right? Well, he now took he his vacation time so he could still get paid. I was like, okay, this guy's taking his vacation time. He's sacrificing. He's willing to make less money. There's and, something there. And he he just about went all in. He's in. He's 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 going to make. You this sold work. your motorcycle. You sold your truck. I, I was like, you need to sell a damn motorcycle. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going for, all in on you not on this for business. Any reason other than I need you, you told, to be alive. You told me at one point you were making fifty thousand a year. Let's say it again. You were making fifty thousand a year at one point. Uh, mm. I thought I said I thought I thought it was, but he said it was a little higher. It now. was a little bit higher. He came 75. to me as like, I need to make this to make payments. I said, I get. Well, f- well figure out. let's make I don't some remember. payments. He's probably high. But he I'm had sure a, it was lower than that. He, he had another. We had another part, or he had another partner. It was uh, his name was, and he was right there by his side from start. Yeah. Thomas Lockhart, yeah. and he did the same thing. He's a cool guy. He yeah. started. He he quit a job that he had no education. He had no backup plan. Yep. He just got out of a major like div- me. a divorce. He had. He was all in. Quit a career at Georgia Pacific that. He worked his way up, and uh, he was making great money, just like Eric was. And he was like, there was something more out there. And he quit his job because he he quit his job. To be honest with you, they quit because they, they believed in me, and it gave me a lot of reinforcement. Like, hey, these guys believe in me. I got to do them right. I got to treat them right. I got to give them love. I got to give them care. I got to give them money. I got to give them – I got to teach these guys how to scale and, and do these things, that things that people pass on to me at a young age, and I was able to overcome and, and, and scale it. But these guys quit these big – careers are there so that they could have scaled up and made a, a, a good living they were already doing it mm-hmm. and went all in on cleaning shitters I know. The of most all un- things the, the most things. unsexy nastiest yep. grimiest job ever he was having a baby thomas was going through a tough time and it was just and then and then they were going they jumped right into a turnaround that i was not in any involvement in and they did it on their own i didn't do it they did it on their own they figured it out and they did it on their own. And all I was there is just to say, hey, keep pushing it. It's gonna get you're gonna get past this little season. And this is a little season right now. Just keep on pushing it, man. It's nasty. It sucks. Yeah. I can't believe that we're coming up on two hours. And I also can't appreciate you guys enough for coming in and just sharing your insights and your stories. And I know everyone listening and watching is I know I got a closing at two fifty. I got to go. So yeah. <laughs> um so we really appreciate all you guys tuning in. I hope you're enjoying the content. And we'd love to see your support. So please give us a like, subscribe, leave us a review. And it means the world to us. And it helps other people find us as well. So if you're curious um, on some of the upcoming episodes, stay in touch with us on social media or comment, um, make some video content, uh, send us an email on some stories. We're happy to read those on air and and see what everyone else um, has an opinion on to maybe help you out. That's Brews in Business, B-R-E-W-S, and then the letter N, B-I-Z. And uh, until then... Cheers and happy brewing. Thank you guys for for coming. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us.